Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy. Remember it so you don't have to. And welcome to X Month. We don't have a doorbell, so I better check that out. Oh God, what are you doing here? And how'd you make that doorbell sound? It's one of his many gifts. So we trust you remember babysitting our teenage nephew today? We warned you about it five months ago. Yeah, but I moved studios hoping you wouldn't find me. We have eyes everywhere. The more I find out about you, the less I somehow know. We don't actually know when we're gonna be done, so best play it by ear. What, do you have some important stuff to do and you can't drag him along with you? No. And we just don't like spending time with him. Isn't that right, buddy? I don't care. Dude, you can't just leave him here indefinitely. So, what do you like? I don't care. It's the following routine just gonna be you answering I don't care to every question. I don't, I don't care. care. Well, if I know modern parroting, just putting a screen in front of you is the best way to raise you. So two screens must be better. You just play on your phone while I watch the first X-Men movie. X-Men? You mean like the Marvel comics? Yeah. I love Marvel comics. Yeah? What do you think about the Marvel movies? They're amazing. They're like the comics come to life. Oh my god. Well, you're gonna love this movie then. <laughs> yeah? When this film came out, every X-Men fan went nuts. So this is a really great and faithful Marvel adaptation. That's what everyone said at the time. And seeing how that was almost 20 years ago, and the landscape for comic book movies has barely changed at all, I think we're both in for a lot of surprises. <laughs> When X-Men came out, there was little faith in it. With the exception of Blade, comic book movies at the time were seen more and more as a big joke. Ever since Batman and Robin left a bad mark in everybody's rubber anuses, comic book flicks were shown very little dignity and even less ticket sales. So when the loud and bombastic yet still poignant and challenging X-Men comic was given the big screen treatment, it was not given much of a budget, or even much credibility. Even the trailer has sort of a B-movie sci-fi channel feel to it, it looked pretty corny. But thankfully, the movie didn't suck, which immediately meant it was amazing! Critics praised how they weren't laughing at a comic book film, which back then was pretty rare. And fans loved seeing a certain amount of dignity, oh hell, any amount of dignity, given to one of the greatest comic book series ever made. But it's not like Doctor Strange where they made the Ancient One into a Celtic woman, or like Iron Man 3 where they made the Mandarin not an alien. It's so annoying when they change stuff like that. Well, again, I haven't watched it in almost 20 years, but seeing how people look back on it so fondly, it has to be a great adaptation! Man, I'm excited! So am I. Let's go back to the year 2000 when people really knew how to do comic book movies. This is... X-Men. Ooh, the X shined! That means they're aware of the title! Mutation. The Final Frontier. We open on a brief narration and, wait, early 2000s movie, I'm guessing quick, fast, blurry shit? You know, this really was the cinematic equivalent of the upside down visor. Every time you see it, you're so glad it's dead. And thus, we open this action packed comic book superhero movie with. a concentration camp. Na 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 na. Yeah, it looks like they're going all the way with this, keeping the backstory of classic X Men villain, Magneto, totally in check. With his parents being killed in the Holocaust, discovering his mutant powers of magnetism at a young age, and creating his hatred for humanity during one of the worst times in humanity's history. At a time when the most recent comic book movie was Mystery Men, this was a ballsy start! Wow, that really is faithful. Oh, you bet! Just look at the next scene that takes place in the not-too-distant future, where we're introduced to Rogue, played by Anna Paquin. It's only a few hundred miles to Anchorage. Rogue. Uh-huh. That's Rogue. Uh-huh. The 20-something, super strong, confident, one-liner spewing badass that sucks people's energy. Uh, close. Now she's a teenager who cries a lot, is super depressed, and can only suck people's energy. So not Rogue. Hey, come on! I mean, Rogue was a tortured character! Yeah, but she was still cool because she was confident. She had one of the cruelest powers. She could never touch anyone without sucking their life away. But she turned that angst into something kick-ass, not taking shit from anyone, socially or physically. You could look up to her because even though you knew she was suffering, she still chose to be positive and full of hope. That's what made her one of the coolest X-Men. Well, sure, if you want to be right, but this character has a lot to look up to. <laughs> like what? Her angsty face that looks like she's trying not to shit her pants. Now that's a 
something I can be inspired by! <laughs> See, she's inspiring me already. Okay, in all fairness, Rogue's not a bad character here. She still has death and has acted very well, it's just... not Rogue. As the film continues, though, we get more faithful interpretations like Charles Xavier, played by Patrick Stewart, Jean Grey, played by Famke Jensen, and Senator Kelly, played by George Costanza's boss. Are mutants dangerous? I propose a poem about Susan's death. This senator thinks the evolution of humans, or mutants as they're called, are a growing threat because their heightened powers are becoming more frequent and powerful. A girl in Illinois who can walk through walls. Now what's to stop her from walking into a bank vault? Okay, can anyone really be taken seriously in front of that Willy Wonka golden ticket mural? She's looking like the virgin on the top. But Xavier sees Kaiser Sose, oh I mean Magneto, walking away. He's played by Ian McKellen. What are you doing here? Why do you ask questions to which you already know the answers? And which one of us is talking right now? I confuse us both a lot. You're sneaking around in your Charles. Whatever you're looking for. Well, if you're looking for mental images in my head, take a gander at this. Ah, oh, there's plenty more gay Middle Earth porn where that came from. This baby's loaded with them. I'm goddamn Gandalf. Meanwhile, Rogue's powers drain the life out of her boyfriend. Or he just found out he signed on to three Resident Evil movies. And she leaves her home in the south and runs away to northern Alberta? Christ, to hitchhike that far, you need the thumbs of Uma Thurman from Even Cowgirls Get the Blues. I thought you said you were going to take me as far as Laughlin City. This is Laughlin City. What was even her plan? Take the absolute zilch money she had and Jack Dawson the world on a drawing in a dream? If she could fly, that'd make more sense. Yeah, we know what you think. Well, maybe this cage fight bar can further her travels. Oh my years, I've never seen anything like that. He can sing, he can dance, he can host the Oscars, yet somehow he's still a credible badass. <laughs> this is for Kate Leopold. This is for Pan. This is for not getting Russell Crowe to drop out of Les Mis. If you're still disappointed they didn't do Rogue right, check out this introduction. Damn. Did I just turn gay? We all did a little bit. From frame one, Hugh Jackman got Wolverine down perfect. It's the same when Michael Keaton was Batman or Christopher Reeve was Superman. You didn't see an actor portrayal, you saw a childhood hero come to life. Sure, there's no mask or costume, but the overload of adrenaline and testosterone is so heavy, it just turned us into steaks. I'm a steak. And that's okay. Damn. He wins the fight as Rogue hangs around the bar, not exactly knowing what to do. I love the beer. Yeah, I hear I'm supposed to be teamed up with this Rogue bombshell who has the hots for me and can suck me dry. Oh god, you're not her, are you? Look out! Logan fights off Steve Wilco, but can't help but sense teen angst in the air. I'm sorry. I needed a ride. Thought you might help me. What the hell are you doing? I mean, you call that a southern accent? It's not nearly as consistent as my Canadian accent, eh? He does decide to give her a bit of a break though, and the two of them seem to form a bond. She even over time starts to see him as a protective role model. The first boy I ever kissed ended up in a coma. You can still feel him, and it's the same with you. Wait a minute. An insecure teen runaway that looks up to Wolverine? That's Jubilee! No, it's a... Uh... <clears throat> totally rogue! It's Jubilee, man! Now that's two characters I'm never gonna see done right. No, 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 that they have her in the movies, like, uh... There, and... There, and in the 80s somehow! Okay, look, clearly they want to do like what they did in the cartoon, with the young newcomer being introduced to the team, serving as the audience. But it's Wolverine who's focused on when the X-Men are introduced. Well, th that's not, look, well, yeah. But at the same time, she has a much more tragic power. She can't touch anything. What a great metaphor for teen angst! So change the power, not the character. They could have replaced her with Jubilee and made her powers blow up everything she touches, so she still couldn't make contact with anybody. In fact, Kitty Pride has a cameo in this, and she's a teenager that can disappear through walls. Not being seen is a far better metaphor for teen angst. You could have done either of those faithfully, and then save Rogue for another movie, where she can be older, badass, and fly. Uh, now, you listen here, young man. I will not have you badmouth what me and my college friends chose to ignore. Whatever. I'm going to go back to playing Tinder Fortnite. Uh, wait, you're going to miss one of the greatest rivalries ever. You see, after a tree falls in front of him, <laughs> He suddenly smells spear gum in the air. 
Whoa, is that Sabretooth? Damn right that's Sabretooth! One of the greatest rivalries of all time is Wolverine and Sabretooth. It's been going on for years in the comics, cartoons, games, it's a classic feud. And now we're gonna see it explored here in the movie! Or he runs away like a bitch. Hey, give him time, give him time! They have a lot of other characters to establish! Establish and ruin? I don't like you. Well, after that quote-unquote battle, Wolverine has a much more terrifying nightmare to face. Waking up without his clothes and being back in school! While also being cast in Australia. Good morning, Logan. Bye, Professor. Bye, Kitty. I look forward to you being recasted twice. So Wolverine is introduced to Xavier and the X-Men who saved him. Cyclops, played by James Marston. And Storm, played by Halle Berry. <laughs> what is up with that wig?! <laughs> it looks awful! Doesn't look that bad. She looks like Gothica, Queen of Dragons. Okay, look here. If you keep laughing like that, you're gonna miss the incredible romance that Rogue has. <laughs> oh, wait, she meets Gambit? Mm. I'm Bobby. Iceman is her love interest? Well, technically, it's Ice Boy. What the hell? They're one of the coolest couples in comic history, and you totally could have made Gambit a teenager. With how rebellious he is, that would have worked fine. I thought you were an X-Men fan. I am! Then how are you okay with this? Look, you weren't there, man. We grew up with Shaq and Steel. Steel! Steel! So Xavier shows Logan that he runs a school for young mutants, and admittedly it is a little weird that Rogue is just immediately tossed in a class. Oh, you're a runaway who just had your life threatened? Get to history class! Don't you even want to call my parents? History class! Welcome to Mutant High. Aw, oh, it's a nice sculpture of dog shit. It looks even more realistic when it starts to melt. But the school is merely our public face. The lower levels, however, are an entirely different matter. I'm still not sure how I got government funding for a military aircraft. Most public schools can't even afford a racist. You know, I think it's the chair. I, I play the pity card pretty high. Meanwhile, looks like Senator Kelly is off to greet more fans, but his helicopter is hijacked by Magneto's goons. A mutant named Toe, played by Ray Park, and a shapeshifter named Mystique, played by Rebecca Romain. I assume she's not Rogue's mother. Why do you ask questions you already know the answer to? Pilot! My greatest fantasy has terrifyingly come true! <laughs> they take him to Magneto's hideout at the former location of Fire Festival, where Magneto has plans for him. Are you a god-fearing man, Senator? That's such a strange phrase. I'm a gods and monsters fan myself. In one of the film's more brilliant additions, Magneto makes a machine that's sort of a gay convergence reversal where a person is transformed into a mutant. What do you intend to do to me? Let's just say God works too slowly. I'm going to pray your humanity away. The only downside? Christ, that is such a boring looking effect. If I was to tell you a giant beam encases you and transforms you into something else, you'd be excited to see that. This just looks like Gozer's fishing net. It's actually making me miss Sky Portals. Sky Portals! Meanwhile, Wolverine and Jean get to know each other better. Where's your room? With Scott down the hall. Was that your gift? Putting up with that guy? I mean, he hasn't had a line yet, but the comic says we hate each other. I can move things with my mind. Really? What kinds of things? I also do amazing things with my thighs. But Logan dares her to read his mind. So read my mind. I'd rather not. She refuses, and then immediately does it. But did he mentally convince her and we couldn't hear it? Read my mind. I'd rather not. Please, 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 please. <sighs> what do you see? Scott. Look, I thought of him naked once. Oh. You gonna tell me to stay away from your girl? Well, if I had to do that, she wouldn't be my girl. So I guess there is a little development of Cyclops and Wolverine's feud, but it once again kind of comes out of nowhere and isn't focused on much to feel genuine. In the cartoon, their personalities are so well-defined, one always following the rules, the other breaking them. But here, we know so little of what Cyclops is like. We just know he wears Tom Cruise shades, so I guess that instantly makes us hate him. You know, it's weird that the best rivalry in this superhero movie is between the two old guys who rarely see each other. In the middle of the night, Wolverine has a flashback about where he came from. Rogue tries to wake him, but he's not a morning person. 
Somebody help! She absorbs his healing power, resulting in her body getting better, and I guess the holes in her PJs, too. She's all right. She'll be all right. Yeah, you're under arrest for stabbing a student. Oh, wait, I forgot. We're on Hogwarts rules. Anything flies in this damn school. Meanwhile, with Kelly's new mutant abilities, he photoshops himself free and swims to shore. And I gotta say, with all the cool powers you could have given him, British sunbathing is not one of the more impressive ones. Even Stan Lee here is like, Boy, when I envision X-Men as a movie, this is not the imagery that came to mind. Meanwhile, Mystique disguises herself as Bobby to tell Rogue to take her Fiona Apple wardrobe out of here. Where is she? Who? Rogue. She's gone. She's gone Rogue! I almost said it. Xavier uses a device called Cerebro to psychically locate her. Oh, I do hope this means more palettes of gray. It's not like the X-Men ever had much color in it. He locates her and Wolverine decides to steal Cyclops' bike to find her. Oh, that bike is amazing, right? How many action scenes is it in? Well... That's what I thought. Hey, this is exciting! X-Bike! Hey, kid. Get to history class! What do you say? Give these geeks one more shot. Wolverine convinces little Green Riding Hood to come home while Cyclops and Storm search for her in the train station. Come along now. I told you. We don't talk to people with Viewmaster eyes. But things heat up when Magneto and Sabretooth attack. Alright, so we're gonna finally see Wolverine and Sabretooth go at it. Sabretooth is going after Storm, and Magneto is going after Wolverine? It should be the other way around! Magneto and Storm should be tossing things at each other, and Wolverine and Sabretooth should be clawing each other's faces off. We're halfway through, and the greatest rivalry ever hasn't even been built up at all! Him and Mystique barely even talk. I can see why they're called mutants, because half of them are friggin' mute! You damn kids! With your Marvel movies refusing to fix what's not broken? In my day, Spawn took orders from a Muppet aardvark, and we liked it! Well, no, we hated it, but we liked hating it! Tell yourself whatever you want to, man. I'm going to watch the Avengers Endgame trailer again. You know Mistress Death isn't in there. Phony movie! Phony movie! <sighs> Hello? Where are you? Well, where are any of us, really? Look, you need to come here and collect your kid. He's an absolute menace! Really? What did he do? He's not liking the X-Men movie! Oh, no. Oh, yes! You come here and pick him up ASAP! Well, that's gonna be pretty tricky, Critic, because I fell asleep chasing a puppy who swallowed government secrets. You pick him up! Fine, God. Uh, just be there at five and I'll come get him. But the movie will be over by then. There's more important things than movies, Critic, like finding a cure for an STD that you yourself created. <sighs> Fine, just be here at five. Good. Oh, by the way, do you know of anyone who can cure an STD that you eat? Come, darling, there's so many more prostitutes to bring back to life! rips the train apart as Wolverine tries to stop him. You must be Wolverine. I'm a giant soup can. What the hell do you want with me? Whoever said I wanted you? You're not my type. I prefer redheads. Blue redheads. It looks like he's after Rogue instead of Wolverine, and he knocks her out cold. Young people. Always trying to run away from needles being thrown at them. What a weird line. The cops tried to stop them, but... That's just awesome. He points their own guns at them, but Xavier controls the minds of Sabretooth and Toad to stop him. What do you wonder for? Can't you read my mind? You forgot my shielded magic helmet. You'll have to kill me, Charles. I don't think I can stop them all. Uh, hey, I have a better idea. <clears throat> Why don't you use Sabretooth you're controlling at the moment to take off his helmet so you can read slash control his mind? 
But the friggin' professor can't figure that one out as he just lets Magneto go. I thought you lived at a school. Just be sure you bring her back in time for history class! Just as the X-Men are about to go looking for him, they get an unexpected visitor. Can I interest you in Bigot Scout cookies? Well, 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 I'm not saying I'm enjoying this. I'm relishing it. So Xavier reads his mind to reveal... What we already know, so it's pointless to show again. As Storm tries to comfort Senator Jelly Donut. I'm here. Don't want to be alone. All right. You know, even Storm kind of sucks. Yeah, even back then I thought that. I mean, Halle Berry can turn in some great performances, but she's not really an image of commanding strength. You look at Storm and you see a goddess of lightning, a presence that demands authority. This Storm acts like a nervous high school counselor on her first day. Do you hate normal people? I suppose... I'm afraid of them. <laughs> can you imagine if one of the guards from Black Panther played that role? That would be awesome. But then we wouldn't have Halle Berry's amazing African accent. Logan, you can't do this alone. Hang on to something. Help us. Fight with us. Where are you going? Has brown hair? Am I allowed to say that sucks? You are. It sucks. Hard. So the senator turns into a melting sperm as his body rejects the mutation. Xavier tries to use Cerebro to find Rogue, but it looks like Mystique infected the machine. Using... Oh no! Green goo! That's always bad in movies! Xavier is knocked out, and after, let's see, two sentences of Cyclops talking to Xavier in the entire movie, we suddenly get a monologue about how close they are. You can still hear me, can't you? You've taught me everything in my life that is ever worth knowing. That if anything happens, I'll take care of them. Aw, they cut away before he sang to him. I've been dreaming of a true love's kiss. But Jean uses Cerebro to locate them as Magneto readies his... Oh god, G.I. Joe bomb! Batteries aren't included! Magnificent, isn't she? Are you going to kill me? Yes. Wow. He just said it. You don't see that happen in movies. His bedside manner is on par with Arnold from True Lies. Are you going to kill me? Yep. Magneto is here. Liberty Island. His objective is to mutate the world leaders at the UN summit on Ellis Island. You know, for the not-too-distant future, maps are becoming very impractically stupid. Wait, I'm gonna put my face on it. You see? You see? You see the funny face it made? You see? Maps! What about Harbor Patrol? Radar. If they have anything they can pick up our jet, they deserve to catch us. Or... you could let them know there's a mutant terrorist at the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, why are they doing this alone? I mean, I know there's prejudice, but if you just say a mutant is about to wipe out the world's leaders, I think some military would get there pretty quick. Maybe then you can fight him with a ton of backup and not leave an entire school unmanaged without an adult. Oh, it's okay. Every kid's just a nuclear time bomb, not always aware how not to explode. You actually go outside in these things? What would you prefer? Yellow spandex? Next you'll be telling me in another Marvel film a raccoon will be firing a machine gun. Oh! Yellow spandex. Gotta love the sick architect who designed this. The giant jet comes out of the friggin' basketball court. They don't give a shit about the children's safety. Imagine some kids just want to play midnight basketball. Oh, I'm gonna whoop your ass good, Billy. No, nah, you're the one that's going down, Billy. Ah! Hey, you're finding more things wrong with the movie, huh? When I see what kids grew up with with comic book movies today and how much more faithful they are, I feel a little jealous about what we got. I mean, yellow spandex, no, that wouldn't work in this more realistic world you created. But then neither do all these plot holes that were originally designed for a bombastic comic universe instead of a down-to-earth one. Yellow spandex would work in Watchmen, in Avengers, and eventually even in later X-Men movies. I'm realizing more and more what they chose to take out and leave in doesn't always match the style and tone they created for this universe. Well, I'm sure that's what they could do at the time. But why didn't they just go all out? Why didn't they make a comic book movie? We all know we're gonna see a comic book movie, so why didn't they make a comic book movie? We knew what we were in for! It, it looks like some good action's coming up. Eh, who cares? No, 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 look, look, let's see. 
So Magneto gets ready to transfer his power to Rogue so she can use the device to transform everybody into a mutant, draining all the life out of her. Once I give my power to the girl, I'll be temporarily weakened. Aren't all men. That's why we leave immediately afterwards. The Blackbird lands, I guess not so elegantly. Sorry? You call that a landing? Call that a punchline? Thankfully, Mystique went to mime school as she stands ridiculously still as they walk past her, and then she takes on Logan's form to attack. <laughs> they just recreate what Hugh Jackman does in the mirror every morning. <laughs> so this fight scene is a little odd. On the one hand, the battle between Mystique and Logan is actually pretty cool and creative, though I didn't know spider manning up the walls was one of her powers. However, the X-Men battling Toad seems a little weak because, well, it's the X-Men battling Toad. Who gives a shit? How could they not take this guy out in a millisecond? Look at this. Storm can control the weather. The friggin' weather, master of the elements. What does she do? I'm gonna go for a stroll. I'll take my time to admire the architecture and, oh no, face my hand politely gesturing you to stop. <laughs> Gestured. They're so pathetic, he even has time to do a little dance. What the hell even was that? I love to sing -a about the moon and the June and the spring. -a. Of course, the natural energy of an elevator shaft obviously brings her powers to life. Do you know what happens to a toad when it's struck by lightning? The same thing that happens to everything else. Oh my god, I'm dying on that! I said lines by George Lucas, the Hemlock Charm! Lucas! Come on, we have to regroup. The other one ain't far away. Well, gee, seeing how these two characters haven't been together for a while, I wonder if one of them. <laughs> You're not part of the group. At least I really hope so. Okay, we're good. They make it to the statue, but Magneto uses his powers to make them act backwards and captures them. Wolverine uses his claws to break free, though, and we have the, uh, <clears throat> most epically built-up fight ever. You know, it's not even like you even needed that much between them. Just an occasional line here or there, an angry glare. You know, like in Waterworld, or Die Hard, or Total Recall. Just a little interaction to build up the hatred between them, and we get none of that. One of the coolest comic book rivalries ever reduced down to just two guys hitting each other. Big friggin' whoop. Oh, come on, the fight's not that bad. Eh, even that's kinda lame. It's a battle on top of the Statue of Friggin' Liberty, yet it looks like a stage set from the movie Chicago. I mean, look at this dated ass effect. Why, wherever did the switch from CGI to live action happen? I simply cannot tell! Hitchcock did a fight on the Statue of Liberty decades earlier, and not only did it feel more grand in scale, but somehow it felt like it had more color than the actual color movie did! But look, he says Bob, just like in the comics. Hey Bob, I'm not finished with you yet. Yeah, I guess that's cool. But why does it look like the Statue of Liberty has a Wolverine earring? And look, after Storm Warp whistles him to the top, we still have to see that radioactive egg drop soup effect almost consume the city. But it ends on a nice note, look! A figurative and literal touching scene where Logan gives his power to save Rogue. Come on, kid. You don't want to miss history class. But look, it's nice. It almost kills him, so he was willing to sacrifice himself for her. I guess. Actually, Jesus, this poor guy spends half the movie friggin' passed out. Narcoleptics have their eyes open more than him. So Magneto is arrested, and Mystique somehow survives three knives to the chest. Yeah, nobody dies in these movies, and somehow everybody dies in these movies. And she takes over the identity of Senator Kelly. Mystique. Son of a bitch. Okay, if that eye thing was on screen for a frame and they paused it at just the right moment, I could see maybe people not catching on to it. But look how long it goes after. From many parents' rights groups. How did everybody miss that? Oh, uh, Senator, this concerns you're turning into Jar Jar Binks. That's absurd. Oh, I mean, uh, at least miss another mutant, ha ha ha. Actually, Binks is worse. Okay, got it. Everyone manages to heal up, and Xavier gives Logan the location of where he might find some answers about his past. So he's off, but not before saying goodbye to Rogue. I kinda like it. It reminds me of how I almost died. I don't want you to go. 
I'll be back for this. No, I gotta take a leak and I hate wearing it in the bathroom. Just hold on to it before I leave you forever. Finally, we see the only real rivals in this movie sequel bait the hell out of this series. Doesn't it ever wake you in the middle of the night? The feeling that someday they will pass that foolish law and come for you. Well, it's American politics and nothing ever gets accomplished, so probably not. The war is still coming, Charles, and I intend to fight it. And I will always be there. Old friend. Unless I die a couple times and or wipe out all mutants off the face of the earth. But you know, these movies are pretty consistent. I can't see that happening. They exit via giant condom, and I guess the most authentic X-Men movie has finally wrapped up. <sighs> wow. You know, you were totally right. When you compare it to comic book movies today, this isn't nearly as impressive as I remember it. Well, it's okay. Yeah? How? As an adaptation, it doesn't have the color, imagination, or depth of characters. As a standalone movie, it's kind of bland with a ton of plot holes. Apparently there was 15 minutes cut from it, and it really shows. It just kind of feels like we go from scene to scene with no big emotional impact ever being made. Well, okay, I guess that's all true, but look at it this way. When it came out, nobody took comic book movies seriously, mostly because they followed the source material even less than this film did. So attempting to be taken seriously talking about prejudice while also trying to be somewhat faithful to a source nobody took seriously was kind of risky. It had to take baby steps, find a middle ground so that future comic book movies could take more chances and risk higher budgets. Sure, the movie's just okay, but being okay back then is what led other comic book movies to being great today. Even if it didn't leave as great a story as you remember, it still left a great impact for comic book movies to follow. Huh. Guess that is a good point. You know, we actually learned a lot with the different comic book movies we grew up with. Yeah, I guess we did. I'll be your aunt and uncle. You know, this was actually a much better experience than I thought it was gonna be. I paid the food to kidnap my son! Dad! Your dad, Mr. T? There he is. There's the guy that kidnapped your son. It certainly wasn't us, because we're saying it certainly wasn't us. That is a foolproof argument. Come here, sucker. I'm gonna kick your ass. Eat my cereal. I pity the fool that don't eat school. He's a nostalgia critic, and he remembers it, but probably not for long. Yeah, this is your ass, and this is your ass on Mr. T. Any questions, fool? Here's the answer. Previously on X Month. John Snow, Lord Commander Mormont has requested you. This costs me my family. When you have children, you always have family. The boss of his family is on trial for his life. Stranded on an island. No one's coming for us. I have the tape you've been looking for. Really? I'm Negan. I want you to work for me. I am looking for a boy who has stolen something from me. Hey. You see something going on? You just start to shoot the life out of him. So? What's next? Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. And welcome back to X-Month. Yeah, they get the idea. Well, with the first X-Men movie being a surprise hit, Fox wasted no time getting a sequel in the works and giving it a much bigger budget. This resulted in X2, X-Men United. The stupidest name movie in the franchise. Yeah, men was too hard for the kids to say, so we'll just put it under the title and make it look like a really cool math problem. Regardless, X-Men 2, X-Men United, because the X stands for X-Men, you're using the title twice as stupid! It was a big hit with critics and audiences. It was a smash at the box office, and for years, people would say this was the best X-Men movie. Because if eh equals wow, then okay equals... But once again, I have to ask, is it worthy of the praise? With how far comic book movies have come, did this add to moving them forward or slow down progress at a time when we just couldn't see it? Well, let's prepare by once again fetishizing the color blue. Seriously, mutants are no other color? Let's take a look at X2, X-Men United. 
I mean, would you call it T2 Terminator's back? The TRA stands for Terminator. It doesn't add up. The film opens once again with Patrick Stewart talking about mutation. As well as this little sneak peek at... <sighs> future botched storylines. We cut to the White House where a suspicious figure appears to have... appeared. Excuse me, sir. Are you lost? Mr. Assange, you know you're not allowed back here again. <laughs> this is a mutant named Nightcrawler, played by Alan Cumming, giving us, let's be honest, the best part of the movie. This scene kicks ass, won't be surpassed. They put Hulk Assange to a blue fox, it's surprisingly that good heart. He seemingly tries to kill the president, but is stopped at the last minute. And after that fast-paced scene with awesome effects and a great makeup job, let's cut to a slow as shit scene with bad green screening and poorly glued Elvis sideburns. This is Wolverine, played once again by Hugh Jackman, exploring an abandoned lab at a dam where he was given his animantium skeleton. And attacked a bag of exploding flour on the way out. Come on. Pay attention. Meanwhile, at a museum, we see Xavier's students on a field trip led by Cyclops, played again by James Marsden, and Jean, played again by Fam K. Jansen. And I do hope you enjoy clips of her looking lost and confused, because that's all the character development you're gonna get out of her in this flick. A shame, she has so much of an identity in the last film, such as... Wolverine liked her. She seems unable to control her powers and feels impending doom on the horizon. I keep feeling something terrible is about to happen. Hey, psychics really can predict the future. Something's happening in the food court. Meanwhile, Rogue, played again by Anna Paquin, hangs with Bobby, Pyro, and Jack Black's thrust face. Hey! Yeah, get used to these obnoxiously warped Brian Singer close-ups. This is kind of when he decided that's his style now. He uses it so much, everybody looks like that creepy Humpty Dumpty from that Kinder commercial. You both shaky. Pyro uses his powers inappropriately when... Oh no, somewhere Zach Morris just said time out. I didn't do this. I did. Actually, this is the work of Xavier, played again by Patrick Stewart, who mentally freezes everybody, which is a power that several times in these movies would have saved the day. But when he says hypocritical stuff like, The next time you feel like showing off, don't. While showing off, just wiping a few memories would have been fine. You can't be surprised they don't really do logical things in this movie like hire a gardener. Somehow I thought you were here to talk about school reform. Meanwhile at the White House, Brian Cox talks with the president and Senator Kelly, who is still Mystique in disguise. He brings up that Xavier's school is a training ground for mutants that could possibly be planning an attack. Now <laughs> where would they get an idea like that? The hell is that? A jet that comes up out of the basketball court. You'll notice the outlines of several flattened children around it. You enter, you detain, you question, but the last thing we need to see is the body of a mutant kid on the 6 o'clock news. Again, their basketball court seems perfectly capable of that. Mr. Stryker, do you really want to turn this into some kind of war? I was piloting black ops missions in the jungles of North Vietnam where you were sucking on your mama's tit at Woodstock, Kelly. You are literally both the exact same age! But you show that youngster hippie! Meanwhile, Wolverine returns, but Bobby isn't so happy to see him because Rogue is so happy to see him. Oh, this is Bobby. I'm He's my... Call me Iceman. Okay, I'm Maverick. Which one of us is Goose? He tells Xavier he didn't find shit at the lab, but Xavier doesn't care because he just found someone to watch the kids while they completely abandon them again. You will be kind enough to watch over the children tonight. Once again, the four people who look after this gigantic place will be out. We can afford a military plane, but babysitters? Mmm. Jean, accompanied by Storm, played again by Halle Berry. Thank God, accentless this time. Has brown hair. Oh. Track down the German-based Nightcrawler in where else? Boston. Can't see house. Ow, those abandoned churches in Boston with people that speak English but speak German because it shows they're German. <laughs> they force him to come down as he reveals that he had little control over his attack. I could see it all happening, but I couldn't stop myself. It was like a bad dream. Perhaps he is testing me. He talks like this every time someone brings up Son of the Mask. Meanwhile, Xavier and Cyclops visit Magneto, played again by Ian McKellen. I'll take him from here. All right, Scott. Oh, if only he could read his mind to know that this was a trap. Yeah, nobody's powers make sense in these. Eric, what have you done? I'm sorry, Charles. I fought it. Face my broccoli and bean burrito of Nostrally Doom! You should have killed me when you had the chance! Ah, uh, I'll get you next time! Uh, we'll meet again! Uh, you and I are not so different! I got a million of these. The leader of the X-Men, everybody! Reflexes like a cat. If it was Garfield. Dead. 
By the way, it'll be almost an hour before you see him again in the movie. I know X-Men fans hate Cyclops, but when X-Men itself hates Cyclops, I think there's a problem somewhere. So it turns out this giant school slash military base slash one man guarded establishment doesn't have a security system. You want these children to die. As soldiers break in, tranquilizing them, forcing Wolverine and others to fight back. Yeah, remember what Xavier said at the end of the last movie when asked what he'll do if somebody tries to break in? I feel a great swell of pity for the poor soul who comes to that school looking for trouble. Glad to see he was totally prepared for that! No alarm system, no security, leaving the school completely abandoned except for one person looking after him. Xavier's School for the Gifted, where children come first and go first. <laughs> Non-Russian Colossus finds a secret way out. Yeah, there's secret passages, but no alarm! Facebook has better security than you. As Rogue decides to separate from the group because... She's Rogue! What would she know about fighting back? Who could it be?! It's nice we finally see Wolverine digging into bad guys instead of chopping walls and fences and hoo <laughs> middle finger! But all of that stops when he recognizes a familiar voice. Wolverine? How long has it been? I didn't realize Xavier was taken in animals. Even animals as unique as you. Every line he has sounds like the narration from Big Fish. I didn't realize Xavier was taken in animals. All the same, I prefer to keep my bones unbroken. Bobby puts an ice ring between them and Wolverine leads them to the garage where he starts a car with his claw. Oh yeah? <laughs> Cause that's totally something he can do now. How the flaming shit does that work exactly? Well, let's see here, uh... There we go! I don't like uncomfortable silences. <laughs> Let it be known that X-Men hates in sync. Meanwhile, in a bar, we see a cameo that'll age great as Mystique, played again by Rebecca Romaine, tries to flirt with one of Magneto's guards. Bottoms up. I certainly hope so. Now it's a singer film! She injects him with iron while we see Stryker holds Xavier captive while controlling other mutants with a brain-altering drug. Naturally, this is injected into the brain by dropping a small amount of liquid behind the neck. Yeah, that's... sure. It turns out Stryker's child is a powerful psychopath that he tortured until he gained back control. So this is all secretly a sequel for Brian Cox's ring character? My son is dead. Just like the rest of you. So, um, how about this place not having a ramp? It's kind of bullshit, is it? Okay, small talk over. Bobby invites everyone to his parents' house where they try to gain their senses and figure out what to do next. These are my grandmothers. I dug her up myself. Thanks. It looks like the Gar Mystique injected carries the iron in his blood for Magneto to use as a weapon. I really don't think that's how iron in the bloodstream works, but who cares, it leads to a pretty badass scene. Code red. Marbles. We have marbles. This, on the other hand, looks a little silly. I just don't see riding a Roomba as especially threatening. I just want to play this sound effect over it. If Marvin the Martian flew in, this would be the greatest Marvel crossover ever. <laughs> Meanwhile, Bobby's parents come home and discover for the first time that he's a mutant. Bobby, have you tried not being a mutant? There's a cable news channel I'm pretty sure says you can do that. Speaking of which, Iceman's brother named... Arnold, I need a nice pun. Frosty! Thank you, calls the police on them. Pyro attacks them as Gene and Storm remind everybody they're in this movie, and Iceman leaves his family. Um, sad, I guess. I mean, we didn't get to know them well for their two minutes on screen, and the brother tried to have him killed. Even the mother's expression is out of focus, it matters so little. And she had the most lines. But, um, this is what it's all about. Seriously, you can move her a little to the left. About. It's all right. You can come out. Oh, yeah, I forgot about this. So Stryker's son controls Xavier's mind to make him control their version of Cerebro to kill all the mutants in the world. There, that took, what, five seconds to explain? But the movie constantly cuts back to this slow-moving scene where the son is convincing him he's a lost girl, Xavier's back at the mansion, and he has to take her to Cerebro. 
And it drags on and on and on. Every time it cuts back to them, it brings everything to a screeching monotonous halt. And the funny thing is, the illusion's not even needed. As soon as he's in there, the girl instructs him to kill all the mutants, which he attempts to do. Find them all. Each one. All of them. Good. Kill them. Well, clearly he would never do that, showing the son has complete control over his mind, so why even make all this up? Did you just want to give a tour of the damn place? And to your right is a wall. And to your left is a wall. And to your right is a wall. And to your left is a naked pig. Don't worry though, that's followed by a boring ass plane chase as the military sees them as a threat and tries to shoot them down through Storm's tornadoes. Okay, so it's nice to see some bigger effects in these movies even though they do look a little fake, but again, it's X-Men, mutants, monsters, aliens. Why are we focusing on a military base they just randomly pass by? They didn't kidnap Xavier, they have no involvement in all this, so who cares? Hey, remember that one issue where they battled the greatest enemy air traffic control? Probably not, because nobody would want to read it, so nobody would want to watch it! Rogue gets sucked out, though, because one of their seatbelts are broken! I swear to God, they want every student dead. But Nightcrawler saves her, as they as well get saved by an unlikely comrade. When will these people learn how to fly? Ah, so even he hates what they did to Rogue. awesome alliance of convenience trope, Magneto teams up with the X-Men to stop Stryker after he reveals he's going to use Xavier to destroy all the mutants of the world. We don't know where this base is. One of you? Why? The professor already tried. Once again, you think it's all about you. Have you seen the posters for this franchise? It is all about him! They read Nightcrawler's mind and discover the lab is where Wolverine went, but it was hidden underground. Funny how his heightened sense of smell didn't pick up the dozens of people that were literally under his nose! Hey. Hey. Oh yeah, I forgot, this was the thing. It's pretty bad in an X-Men movie when you forget Logan wants Jean. Don't make me do this. Do what? This. But we've had whole seconds of chemistry! SECONDS! But if you think that romance isn't well built up, Mystique, now out of nowhere, suddenly has a thing for Logan. You know what I want. This has never been brought up before, and will never be brought up after. It's the Julia Roberts getting big and hook scene. Apparently, the only reason this scene was in the movie was to get an image of its two biggest stars, Hugh Jackman and Halle Berry, in bed together. This is ironic because there's tons of comic material with Wolverine and Storm as a couple, but somehow it was easier to have Mystique spontaneously horny for him. How is it Hugh Jackman had no problem with his character having several beautiful women on top of him? I just realized I answered my own question. Speaking of spontaneous team us, Magneto and Pyro talk for a minute. And that immediately justifies him turning evil by the end. You are a god among insects. Never let anyone tell you different. In a magnifying glass to an ant sort of way. I'm sorry, I can't follow this map unless you use needles. Can you teleport inside? No. I have to be able to see where I'm going. Or in a plane spinning midair out of control. They're both basically the same thing. Magneto doesn't want to take a chance on Wolverine because he doesn't know the technology to open the doors, so he looks towards Mystique. Which is why none of us are surprised when it's revealed that this is Mystique. But honestly, I'll give it a pass because it gave us this gif. How many fans use that on future X-Men movies? She's good. You have no idea. Ew, that's what you meant by you have blue balls. The X-Men search the place to try and find the kids when Wolverine decides, screw the kids, I just want to know where I came from. Is there like a list of worst movie schools ever? He was the babysitter! By the way, is Cyclops still an X-Men? Oh, there he is. God, don't do this! You know, for X-Men United, they sure are separated, dividing, or fighting against each other a lot, aren't they? It looks like he's been brainwashed too as he attacks Jean, but she diverts the hit to the dam. So, just a reminder, all the misery that is to follow is completely his fault. Why do so many kid shows have unlikable leaders? Gene, no, 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 it's okay. But luckily, Gene snaps him out of it with... I honestly don't know, a big boom, I guess. Bada boom. As Logan finds the room where Stryker experimented on him, discovering that he was experimented on and Stryker did it. So not a goddamn thing! Oh, wait, we do find out that Animanium has to be hot. That should tide us over until our inevitable disappointment. <laughs> Striker six his bodyguard named Deathstrike on him. Now in the comic they had this huge rivalry. You already know they don't care. 
As is par with these movies, Wolverine always gets the funniest swear. Holy shit. At some point they'll put together that the more they have him swear, the better the movie will get. We get a pretty decent fight between them, and even a pretty cool death scene. But it looks like Walmart Cerebro has located all the mutants for Xavier, and his brainwashed mind tries to kill them all. But Magneto stops him, plays wall Tetris, and in my always favorite scene when bad guys team up with good guys, the bad guys inevitably turn into dickheads again. <laughs> Stryker tries to escape, but Wolverine stops him before he takes off. Who am I? If you really knew about your past, the work we did together. What we did to Blob, Gambit, and Deadpool, it's too awful to conceive! He makes sure Stryker doesn't leave as the X-Men save the kids, but have to get inside to stop Xavier from killing mankind. Kurt, I need you to take me inside. But if I can't see where I'm going... I have faith in you. I mean, you... Totally caught a person mid-air without seeing where she was. Oh, Father, light in heaven, hallowed be thy name. There was no window facing her, and yet you got her on the first try. The kingdom come, thy will be done on Looks like you were facing away from the plane when you teleported back, so I really don't see how this is a big deal. Oh, he made it, thank God, so suspenseful. It looks like Storm needs to free Stryker's son in order to break the illusion. It's about to get very cold in here. I'm not going anywhere. Why? Can't he just warp out and then warp back in when she's done? And why can't she just keep Nightcrawler warm the same way she's clearly keeping herself warm? Maybe she saw Viva Rock Vegas and wanted to punish him. It seems to work as they save the professor. We get the closest thing we'll ever see to Rogue flying, and Magneto again runs into Stryker who has plans for him. He moves him over there! Kind of the equivalent of duct taping someone to a wall doesn't seem that bad. Pyro ends up joining Magneto. It was a very convincing two-minute talk. But the dam is about to break apart, resulting in... Let's just be honest, the most nonsensical of escape plans. Ugh, here we go. Jean walks out of the plane, lifts the plane in the air, pulls a Moses, and then sacrifices herself to the water. I know what I'm doing. This is the only way. Really? That was the only way? Iceman couldn't have frozen the water. This is the only way. Storm couldn't have stopped the water. This is the only way. Xavier couldn't have lifted the plane from inside. This is the only way. She couldn't have lifted the plane from inside. This is the only way. You just really want a Wrath of Khan this because you're such a Star Trek bitch that you even took a small part pushing buttons in one of the most hated of Star Trek movies, didn't you? This is an edited version of Brian Singer saying yes. I know it! Jeep, listen to me. Do this. We barely had something together. Goodbye. She lets the water finally engulf her as the X-Men put together that Jean is <clears throat> dead. She's gone. No! You don't say that! <sighs> oh, I'll miss how we knew nothing about her outside of how poorly she teased the next movie. The president is about to make an address about harsher laws on mutants when Xavier freezes the production to let him know that not all mutants are threatening. While threatening the ever-living shit out of him! Then you also know I don't respond well to threats. Mr. President, this is not a threat. This is an opportunity. That terrifying lightning is totally to put your mind at ease. There are forces in this world who believe that a war is coming. Some have already tried to start one, and there have been casualties. Casualties we barely knew. The next move is yours. We'll be watching. Again, not a threat. Totally not a threat. We are so watching. So America completely ignores that four minutes of dead air, and the president decides not to push for harsher laws on mutants. Well, first of all, I really doubt that would fly, but let's, for the sake of argument, say that is what happened in America. The entire world was attacked! Even if the U.S. backed down, every other country would be World War III-ing the hell out of this shit! But, for the sake of... I don't know, just ending this almost two and a half hour movie, the plan works, and Wolverine lets Cyclops know Jean loved him most. She didn't make a choice. It was you. Wait a minute. Did she have a thing for you, Wolverine? <gasps> oh yeah, you didn't know about that, um... Look, Omega Red! What? He's not even a character yet! Damn it! And in case you had any doubt this movie was a total Star Trek II ripoff, here's the opening narration read by the person who just died, building up that they're gonna be back in the next film with almost the exact same music. Space. The final frontier. Mutation. It is the key to our evolution. 
where no man has gone before. But every few hundred millennia, evolution leaps forward. Oh my god, the Firebird! You crushed those expectations right now! So that was X2, what's hailed by many to be one of the best, if not the best, X-Men movie. How impressive is that again? Honestly, the film is super long, needlessly slow, has a ton of pointless moments, even more plot holes than the first one, and way too many characters to give them enough time to be interesting. With that said though, there is an occasional moment of coolness, a nice action sequence here and there, and mostly a fair amount of good acting to make me care just enough. It's definitely on the lower level of okay, but it is still okay. Nothing special, but nothing that bad either. It's a mostly boring, mostly inconsistent, but mostly harmless comic book adaptation. Then hey, seeing how much this film is building up the next one, it has to pay off, right? I'm the Juggernaut, bitch! Previously, on X Month, 13 years ago. Billy! Hey, what's up? I just saw X Men 3. Yeah, how was it? It was awful! Really? They focused a ton on Wolverine. Yeah. Like everyone dies. Dude! And they even kill off Xavier! Oh my god, this sounds like the worst movie ever. It is. I'm gonna hang up now because of how angry I am. As you should. Goodbye! Ten years later. Billy! Hey, what's up? I just saw Logan. Yeah? How was it? It was awesome! Really? They focus a ton on Wolverine. Yeah? Like everyone dies. Dude! And they even kill off Xavier! Oh my god, this sounds like the best movie ever! It is! I'm gonna hang up now because of how happy I am. As you should! This was worth staying in the same spot and never changing my clothes for a decade. Goodbye! Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember it so you don't have to. And welcome back to X-Month, where now we look at one of the most hated X-Men movies, if not the most hated X-Men movie, X-Men The Last Stand. With the directing chair now being filled by Brett Ratner, from one non-controversial director to another, X-Men The Last Stand was less than a critical darling and an absolutely despised addition to the X-Men franchise. Fans hated how many characters died, how unfocused it was, how it seemed to amount to nothing, how it killed President Kennedy, how it caused the Great Depression, and how it directed Norma the North 2. You couldn't contain the amount of hatred this movie got and still gets today. I kind of have a soft spot for it. Okay, I'm not insane. I know this movie is bad and doesn't work. From a structural standpoint, it's one of the worst sequels ever made, especially when you get to the end. But after how boring and wowless the other two were out of the original three, I kind of consider this one the most entertaining. It has the most risks, the most action, the most color, the most mutants, and the most compelling ideas outside of just Prejudice sucks! Oh yeah, we went there! Sure, its story and characters are weak and the ending doesn't really go anywhere, but I'm kind of used to that in these movies by now. I mean, what's worse, safe, bland, middle-of-the-road tedium, or batshit insanity that never once left you bored? Well, that's the geeky complication we're gonna analyze here today. Let's take a look at the clearly bad, but in my opinion, enjoyably bad, X-Men The Last Stand. The film opened several years ago with a mostly convincing age restoration of Xavier, played again by Patrick Stewart. Magneto, on the other hand, played again by Ian McKellen, is looking more like a PS4 character. When are you going to stop lecturing me? When you start listening. <laughs> and you're here because I need you. Oh yes, the pictures have told us. They go to visit a young Jean Grey who apparently has unbelievable powers to make people look less like their action figures. Jean's powers seem to be running amok, but Xavier says he can help her control it. Did you think you were the only one of your kind, young lady? 
And I hope never to bring this up or think about it the majority of times we meet. Oh, Gene, by the way, to save all the mutants of the world, it'd be extremely helpful if you could, you know, unleash that most powerful entity in the universe thing. Nothing? Nada? God, this better make more sense when your sons are stuck. Meanwhile, at a later date, guys, is this a timeline or a math problem? We get a pretty grisly scene of a young mutant trying to cut his wings from his back. This kid deserves a freaking Oscar for the less than one minute of acting that he's given. <laughs> Not you. Dad, I'm sorry. <laughs> wow, I can't wait to see the development they give this character to justify such horrific imagery. How much screen time does he have? Should I get used to things being dramatically built up with no payoff? <laughs> Got it. Got it. Back in the not-too-distant future's past, we see Storm, played again by Halle Berry, and Wolverine, played again by Hugh Jackman, training young mutants in a lawsuit battlefield. The whole world's gonna hell, you're just gonna sit there? Come on, it's the third one. We're all on autopilot here. We're getting killed out here. Oh, you read the reviews. Logan has non-Russian colossus throw him at the threat, and a sigh of disappointment is given when you realize the upside-down fake sentinel head is far better looking than the actual sentinels we would get later. Class dismissed. Tell Bumblebee I love him. They turn off the holodeck, I mean danger room. Yeah, they're both owned by the same guy. As Rogue, Anna Paquin, is pissed that her boyfriend, Iceman, is getting too friendly with another mutant named Kitty Pride, played by Ellen Page. I mean, something's wrong. What's wrong is I can't touch my boyfriend without killing him. Other than that, I'm wonderful. Again, nailing her character great. Have I ever put any pressure on you? You're a guy, Bobby. Your mind's only on one thing. I'm gonna go talk to that Gambit boy. No, wait, that's what the fans would want. We don't do that in these movies. Meanwhile, Cyclops, James Marsden, is having trouble coping with Gene's death from the last movie. I know how you feel. Don't. When Gene died, I said don't. Maybe it's time for us to move on. You and I, that one night of passion, it's over now. Not everybody heals as fast as you, Logan. <laughs> well, I am pretty awesome. We then cut to Beast. I mean Beast. I mean Kelsey Grammer is Beast. I mean Beast. Yeah, they nail Beast. It's amazing how well they got this character down. From his casting, to his makeup, to his sophistication, to his animal-like fighting, even him reading upside down. Next to Wolverine and Xavier, this is as perfect a realization of a cinematic X-Man can be. A major pharmaceutical company has developed a mutant antibody. A way to suppress the mutant X gene. Permanently. How am I taking him so seriously when that ridiculous amount of makeup is staring back at me? He looks like a Rogaine Smurf and yet I'm hanging off of his every word! Even the world they inhabit seems a little bit more evolved. As mutants are now being hired into political office and people focus less on wiping them out as much as helping them out. Though even that's quite a loaded issue as well. Apparently a quote cure for mutation has been found, ironically in a mutant, who can take people's powers away if they come near him. They transform this into a drug that can take mutant powers away and unsurprisingly this causes a lot of controversy. I mean what kind of coward would take it just to fit in? Is it cowardice to save oneself from persecution? This is a callback to one of the best X-Men cartoons entitled The Cure, where mutants try to figure out whether or not it's ethical to be free of their powers. Give this movie credit for asking similar difficult questions. Is mutation something to be fixed, like bad vision? Or is it a part of your identity and what makes you who you are? Should you change or society change? Mutants have different responses depending on their powers. Not all of us can fit in so easily. You don't shed on the furniture. Is it true? They can cure us? They can give us real accents? There's nothing to cure. Nothing's wrong with you. Or any of us, for that matter. I do also give credit that Storm has a bit more character in this than the previous films. Though maybe it's just the better wig. Their affliction is nothing more than a disease. And this site, once the world's most famous prison, will now be the source of freedom. Yes, I'm sure going to Alcatraz to have people who see you as a disease genetically alter you won't be intimidating at all. These so-called mutants are people just like us. But I stand here today to tell you that there's hope. You know, I want to listen to this guy, but I keep looking around expecting to see one of the Penguin's goons to flip in and steal his baby. However, some groups are taking this further as Magneto infiltrates an angry gathering of mutants. By the way, doesn't anyone clean up churches in the not-too-distant future? Make no mistake, my brothers. They will draw first blood. The only question is, who will you stand with? The humans? Or us? I'll be selling my CDs in the back. I live stream Thursdays. You talk pretty tough for a guy in a cape. You know who you're talking to? Do you? The gritty reboot of Sonic the Hedgehog? 
Meanwhile, Cyclops returns to where Jean was lost, but discovers she's not quite dead. No, you're not. You'll be stone dead in a moment. <laughs> There's sadly a lot of truth to that. She shows off to Cyclops how powerful she's become by coming back to life, controlling his laser eyes, and as if that wasn't enough, she blows him up. Oh no, not Cyclops. He was... a character? Anyway, I've seen Westworld. I know he'll be right back. Get to Alkali Lake. Xavier feels a great disturbance in the X-Force, so he sends Storm and Logan to check it out, and they discover Jean is still alive. But how can that be? Well, that much built up Phoenix saga is about to pay off, involving aliens and firebirds and several levels of psychological and physical identity. Her powers wrapped her in a cocoon of telekinetic energy. Okay. Jean developed a dual personality that in our sessions came to call itself the Phoenix. What? 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 Is the woman in front of us the Jean Grey we know? Or the phoenix, furiously struggling to be free. So, no aliens, no firebirds, only one personality, and all this is happening... ...because of water. Yeah, they say Xavier kept it dormant, but they never said what triggered it back to full force, so the only conclusion we can come to is... ...water! Just add water, boom! Crazy! Boy, the Wizard of Oz would have been a different flick if that was the outcome. <laughs> Oh, no, you don't, you evil witch! Dorothy, no! <laughs> you have unleashed the psychotic part of my mind to making me the most powerful force in the world! Yeah, Dorothy, what did you think would happen? Well, I thought she would melt! That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard you say! But I... No! I thought that no. she... No! No! Um, I'm still here. So the first person to be given the cure is the creator's son, the boy we saw in the opening named Archangel. In that, the credits call him that, but nobody in the movie ever does. Calm I can't down. do this! I promise you, it's yeah. fine. Warren, relax. Oh man, I'm glad he didn't take it. Oh, not for any ethical reasons, it's just the wings are the only way I can tell him apart from Malfoy. And just to be overly dramatic... Warren, no! Doors are for practical people! I'm here to shove a visual metaphor down moviegoers' throats! And maybe that metaphor would have worked if it wasn't used on characters who had less than five minutes on screen. Both the person being watched and the person watching are barely in this. Weird how feeling for an image and relating to an image seem to be intertwined. Yeah, I'm sure this will be underwhelming too, as Magneto plans to break out Mystique, who's been captured by law officials. Now what, is he gonna use his deadly marbles again? Maybe lift a car? Well, that was awesome. Oh, I mean, uh, nothing's good in this movie! Mm! He breaks her out, which I kind of enjoy, seeing how she broke him out in the previous film, and, eh, while in this mutant criminal grocery store, he decides to go shopping. James Matrix. He was arrested for being Seth MacFarlane five times when once was already too many. What did they call you? Juggernaut. He was arrested for quoting internet memes. I'm the Juggernaut! Yeah, yeah, we'll get to it. One of the guards tries shooting the cure at them as Mystique gets hit and transforms into a human. Thus, Magneto abandons her. Presumably because she lied about being a real redhead. Such a shame. She was so beautiful. Now, on the one hand, I kind of like this. It emphasizes how deep his prejudice goes, and like most oxymoron bigots, he's consistent in how hypocritical he is. But there is one huge problem with this. The situation should go more like, Oh dear, well I better take you to my machine that turns people into mutants. I know it had a few problems, but with me being a scientist and there being great breakthroughs in DNA transformation, I can totally work with this. Oh wait, I guess that's off the table now. Okay, laters. I'm sorry, my dear. You're not one of us anymore. I mean, the fact that she grew up as Xavier's sister was totally fine, but... Yeah, that still doesn't connect to any of these. Beast is outraged that the cure has been weaponized without his knowledge, thus he tells the president he's resigning. Someone fired or resigning from the president's cabinet? Man, that's rare these days. Have you even begun to think what a slippery slope you're on? I have. And I worry about how democracy survives when one man can move cities with his mind. As do I. You and I know that it's only going to get worse. All the more reason why I need to be where I belong. Wow. 
both of them are asking very tough, polarizing questions. Kind of makes you wonder what you would do if you were put in a similar scenario. No, I mean, it sucks! Every part of this sucks! It's Transformers 12! Meanwhile, the supposed most dangerous mutant in the world wakes up with just Wolverine as security. You know, it's becoming easier and easier to believe that the apocalypse happened four times in these movies. One of them is called that! And it appears she's not in control. Look at you, Logan. He's tamed you. Gene? There is no Gene, only Phoenix. Wait. That remarkable metal doesn't run through your entire body, does it? But Fifty Shades of Jean Grey will have to wait as she busts out and goes to her parents despite her parents never showing up in the rest of the movie. It's not the first time in these films someone abandons what's supposed to be the most important. What the hell are you doing here? Visiting an old friend. Magneto and his goons are there as well as Xavier and him agree to approach her alone. I came to bring Jean home. Don't interfere, Eric. Just like old times, huh? She needs help. Okay. <laughs> this visual needs sitcom music. One's a peaceful professor, the other a genocidal extremist. Together, they have to convince a woman not to blow up the world because everyone thinks the Dark Phoenix is the only part of the Phoenix there was. Can they stop her insanity while having a little fun along the way? Fox presents Jean-Luc and Gandalf, some wacky wit from Wacky Brits. They do a good job making Jean pretty intimidating and downright creepy at times, but for going back to her childhood home, there's no exploring her past, her psychology, what led her to this mental state. She just starts tossing shit. Yeah, it's not like the Phoenix had any mental play whatsoever. That's it. Even the fight, despite it being impressively choreographed, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Magneto says, Nobody gets him, son. Well, obviously the first thing to do then is throw him inside. Though let's be honest, that was only done for this stunt. Which makes no sense, but I still friggin' love. As Jean takes house flipping a little too seriously, Xavier gives Logan one final look before being turned into powdered X-Lax. That's the look of a guy saying, you're going to be changing me in the near future. So X-Man, Xavier is extinct as Magneto steals Jean away and the X-Men realize they have to carry on not only without their leader Cyclops, but without their mentor Xavier as well. Gee, I've never seen that done in these movies before. We must carry on his vision of a world united. This hits our X-Men pretty hard, especially, oh, which one was Juno again? Kitty. Oh yeah, Kitty Pride. It has been over 40 minutes since we've given her or Iceman a scene, so. Yeah, there's nothing to help get over the death of your mentor like flirting with someone you barely know while your current girlfriend watches. What an axe-hole! Where are you going? You don't know what it's like to be afraid of your powers. Hello? I want to be able to touch people, Logan. I hope you're not doing this for some boy. No, it's for some boy. Oh yeah, that's totally what I'm doing. Well, if you want to go, then go. Just be sure it's what you want. Well, I don't know if it's what I want. I haven't asked Bobby yet! how Jean, even though she wasn't really developed, I mean, okay, we're used to that in these movies, but she was at least a little creepy. We'll throw that out the window, as for the majority of the rest of the movie, she does nothing but give one blank stare. Again, something we've sadly become familiar with in these films. She made her choice. Now it's time we make ours. So if you're with us, then be with us. Again, give credit that at least Storm has a bit more character, taking a little bit more charge, and this maybe kind of ties into fans that believe she should have been the leader of the X-Men instead of Cyclops. But every time Jean is even close to being more developed, they always push away. In some cases, literally, like when Wolverine tries to track her down. I came for Jean. Do you think I'm keeping her against her will? Sorry, we're paying her by the line in this one. You should have seen the deal we got with Cyclops. You don't know what you're dealing with. I know full well. I'm gonna make you do stupid things. <laughs> Quit hitting yourself! Quit hitting yourself! <laughs> Quit hitting yourself! Now go! Look out! You run into Ash from Evil Dead 2!
The SWAT team finds Magneto's army, but it turns out it was just multiple men as a diversion. Okay. I give up. Ah, ah, now I'm gonna be sent back to jail and have my powers taken away. Why did I agree to this? Magneto is actually throwing a mutant pride parade as he plans to get his army to Alcatraz via... The holy shit amazing scene. Jesus Christ, that's not X-Men at all! No, no, not at all! That's, you never see that in a comic, and it's not imaginative, not big, or epic, or anything like that. It's, it's, it's lazy, it's, 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 it's stupid, it's incompetent, it's... God, that still holds up! Though it is funny how it goes from dusk to complete night in a matter of a few seconds. And I do mean a few seconds. Actually, that reminds me. Hey, didn't we have a scene to shoot at dusk today? Uh, yeah, but sunset starts at 5 and it's 5 o'clock right now. But that should give us plenty of time to oh, shoot- Oh, no, it's actually 5.01 now, we just missed it. Curses! How did this happen? I don't know, climate change? How's that affect the sunset? I don't know, it's just always climate change. Things are always so strange when you two are around. Well, that's weird, because things get a lot more normal when you aren't around. Magneto's army plans to kill the boy supplying the cure, but they have a lot of obstacles to get through. In chess, the pawns go first. I call them the test audience. But the X-Men show up to stop them, and the, uh, <clears throat> not the least bit kick-ass climax begins. Trying to find something awesome in this movie, like Juggernaut and Kitty Pryde chasing each other through concrete walls, pedestrian setting projectile cars on fire, boring Kelsey Grammer as Beast launching into the air, roaring and ripping people to shreds. <sighs> Have you even read an X Men comic? Where's Xavier showing a girl around Cerebro for hours? That's the kind of excitement that ignites the imagination. Oh, don't worry, though. There's still plenty of stupid to go around. Like this line that launched a million groans. Don't you know who I am? I'm the juggernaut, bitch! Yeah, if you want to know what every X-Men fan's reaction was to this internet meme suddenly making it into a big blockbuster movie, it went exactly like this. Don't you know who I am? I'm the juggernaut, bitch! Then there's this scene where the mutants try to kill the scientists in charge. You're the guy that invented the cure, right? Yep, that's her. Please, don't do this. I only wanted to help you people. Do we look like we need your help? All we need is a script, Doctor! Ah! Yay! That kid who had less screen time than the catering credit got to save his dad! Because that's what it's all about! Wolverine even manages to learn how to work with the X-Men as a team. We work as a team. Best defense is a good offense. Because that's what it's all about! Also gotta love how Beast resigns because they weaponized the cure, and he uses the weaponized cure to inject Magneto! You and I know that it's only going to get worse. All the more reason why I need to be where I belong. In the hypocritical gray zone jacuzzi that this film is keeping me nice and warm in. No! Decides once again to go berserk, though, as she begins wiping out everybody on the island. What have I done? Is it me, or does it look like he's asking the audience that upon finishing the film? What have I done? You ever wonder if this is Thanos' porn? Like, he just stays up late at night, like... Oh yeah, turn him to dust, you sexy thing. Turn him to dust. God, I'm lonely. It looks like Wolverine is the only one who can approach her due to his fast healing. I guess that kind of looks like a firebird, even though you promised us an actual firebird, but I guess that meant a symbolic firebird.
Look, I know you want to see me naked, but can I go one of these movies with my body mostly covered? I'm tired of people seeing my huge Ackman! He gets her back to her normal self just so he can kill her. Yep, she came back and went crazy just so she could die again. Yeah, that's actually all they do with her. Man creates Gene. Man destroys Gene. Man recreates Gene. Man destroys Gene. Man, this movie's bullshit. And the ending only gets worse from here. We see Kitty Pride at Xavier's grave. Because clearly no other character had a stronger connection with him. As these movies have now gone full force into making Rogue barely recognizable to 100% unrecognizable as she had her powers taken away. This isn't what I wanted. I know. It's what I wanted. Aw, oh, so she did it for herself. Now let's reconnect with a boy who was about to cheat on you because he couldn't touch you and remind yourself that it had nothing to do with him. Cause that's what this is all about. Hey look, Wolverine is proud that Beast is back in the White House, putting their two-sentence rivalry behind them. Way to go, furball. Because that's what this was all about! Logan tries to figure out if he owns the school or what. Nothing else is discovered about his past, despite the other films talking about it. I mean, poorly, but they did talk about it. And we see Magneto's powers are coming back, proving the cure pointless. Xavier comes back to life, proving his death pointless. But that Archangel kid is still flying around in the background for a millisecond. Thus, that's what this was all about. I have no idea what this movie was about. For a film called The Last Stand, it doesn't stand by jack shit. This movie raises the stakes, raises the body count, raises the issues and questions, and yet never follows all the way through, so it ends up saying nothing. Want proof? There's an alternate ending where Rogue doesn't get the cure, proving even they had no idea what they were trying to say. I couldn't do it. I'm sorry, Bobby. This is me. The whole movie just feels like a lot of big scenes that never connect or build up to anything. And when you have a movie that makes a lot of huge choices resulting in a lot of huge deaths, it has to amount to something. You can't back down on that. With that said, there are still a lot of amazing scenes to appreciate. Some great action, great effects, great makeup, great ideas, and yes, even some great character moments. All of these scenes on their own would be fine. Maybe that's why a lot of them have so many hits on YouTube. Because individually, they're really impressive and deserve more credit when people just scoff that there's nothing good in this film. But it's the equivalent of having all your favorite food on one plate. Alone, they're great. All together, it's a giant mess. So yes, in comparison to the other films that, while slow and uneventful, did have a beginning, middle, and end, this tosses all of that away for some big scenes that practically destroy what the other films were trying to do. In that respect, it's one of the worst sequels ever made because it disappointed fans who really got into these movies. But for me, I never got that much into these movies. I thought they were okay at best. I watched them because I liked X-Men, but these films never really represented X-Men. At least, not the X-Men I was familiar with. They were dull, colorless, restrictive, middle-of-the-road adventures from a franchise that was the exact opposite of that. This one at least was big, loud, fun, energetic, imaginative, visually stunning, action-packed, and had good dilemmas despite them never following all the way through with it. So while it is technically bad when I think of the bombastic, cool, adrenaline-filled X-Men fighting against varying types of prejudice, this is the one that gives me a more enjoyable time. So it's picking your poison the safer, blander, but ultimately better put together films, or the over-the-top hyper punch fest that constantly insults your intelligence. Whatever you choose, one thing's for sure. For some, this is an enjoyably bad movie, but it is still a bad movie. Well, that about does it for X Month, and next week I have a brand new movie to review. <clears throat> Aren't you forgetting something? No! No, I'm not! There never will be another X-Men movie! There never has been another X-Men movie! A box on you! Wow, he has really repressed X-Men Origins Wolverine, hasn't he? Yeah, that's why I put a copy of it under his desk to remind him he needs to review it. Oh, how do you know he'll find it? He found it. Cool. Cool. Previously on X-Month. Uh...
Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember it so you don't have to. And welcome to the final installment of X Month. Well, with X-Men The Last Stand leaving the bad taste of animanium dick in most people's mouths, it only made sense to cut out the middle... X-Man, so to speak, and focus on the one that people loved most. Even before the movies, Wolverine had always proven to be X-Men's most popular character, even spawning his own successful comic series. So it was decided a new movie series called X-Men Origins was to begin, each film going into the backstory of a different mutant. There was actually talks for a while of Ian McKellen doing an X-Men Origins Magneto movie. But everyone wanted to see how their most popular character, Wolverine, fared with his own film. Well, let me tell you, this is what they do with their most popular characters? I'd hate to see what they do with the shit-stained body parts of their unpopular ones! <laughs> X-Men fans have their differences, but one thing they can all agree on is X-Men Origins Wolverine sucks. What should have been the easiest movie to make the most awesome, badass, and fun became the most inconsistent, dull, and downright baffling in terms of story and character choices. Most X-Men fans and non-X-Men fans agree it's the worst of the movies. And we're here to analyze how this middle claw of a flick happened. Let's wrap up X-Month the right way, well, a way. This is X-Men Origins Wolverine. It opens up in 1845. Well, my knowledge of Wolverine only goes back to 1974, so I guess I just have to judge it less as an adaptation and more as a shitty movie. We see a young Logan as we discover his original name is Jimmy. So wait, Jimmy? We're brothers, Jimmy. You realize that? God, I so wish they retitled this now. As his house is broken into when a stranger apparently killed his father. The kid for the most part plays a young Wolverine pretty well, but you have to watch out when the person in charge directs you poorly in a shot. <laughs> yep, that's the one. This kid should have a therapy session with the one from Christmas Story Live. Oh, the scary, hilarious consequences of bad direction. He extends out his bone claw. Tell me that's the name of a D&D character or a wrestler. Okay, good. And he stabs the man to death. But the man reveals that he was his father all along. So Let's dive into these characters we just met to appreciate why this is so dramatic, or we're just leaving before we establish why we're supposed to care. Get used to that. It looks like his brother Victor, who will later become Sabretooth. Okay, that I do need clarification on. Okay, good. What were you thinking? Run away into a title sequence where they show every war they ever signed up for. Marvel Civil War, Saving Private Ryan Reynolds, X-Men Apocalypse Now. And through all of it, Wolverine grew up fast into Hugh Jackman and just kind of stayed that age for the next hundred years. Until these two movies and then suddenly white hair. And Sabretooth grew up into Lee Schreiber, who finally perfected his dolphin jump. <laughs> In all seriousness, the credits are probably the best part of the movie. Which saying that out loud makes me realize how much trouble we're in. <laughs> They're captured though and approached by William Stryker, played this time by Danny Houston. Your sentence was carried out by a firing squad of 10 hundred hours. It tickled. Who offers them the chance of a lifetime. I'm putting together a special team with special privileges. I'm calling it the Ass Avengers. They of course agree, and if you were to tell me the guy on this plane most likely to get a game-changing Marvel movie would be the one from The Proposal, I'd ask how you did things so wrong yet so right at the same time. That's funny, Wade. It's probably not as intimidating as having a gun or fingernails of a bag lady. To the film's credit, it is mostly cast well. Schreiber's a decent saber tooth. We know Ryan Reynolds will be a good Deadpool. And maybe Wolverine listens to Black Eyed Peas dropped off in Nigeria, where they tried to keep a low profile, walking like the poster for every Expendables movie. Cool, his mutant power is to bug bunny people to death. The enemy stops them in the elevator, though. They took the elevator? As Deadpool reveals his mutant power is using Guntana. An email said your prince was in trouble. We're here to transfer funds. I want this, but that is nothing. A souvenir. It looks like they're after a rock that the crime lord said was from a small village and he thought was just a useless souvenir. So in hindsight, they could have just asked him for the damn thing instead of claiming so many goddamn lives. He says that it's sacred. <laughs> Did he break his neck or adjust it? No, oh, thank you. Can you crack my back next? It's on! Hey, you know what'd be interesting? Showing us how Sabretooth got his bloodlust. I mean, it is called Origins, but we never goddamn see how these two became who they are. 
What happened when they ran away from home? They just went into war? How did that impact them as characters? How did it change them? What were they like before? What were they like after? The idea behind an origin story, especially a prequel, is to see how their actions and environment shape who they are. But who they are in the first 10 minutes is pretty much exactly who they are by the last 10 minutes. The biggest change is from a little boy to a grown man and that only lasts a minute. Stuff happens to them all throughout the movie, but we never see how it alters them in any way. This Wolverine is the exact same as this Wolverine. He just doesn't have metal claws. And he's called Jimmy. Jimmy! We can't just let you walk away. Take this for example. Jimmy leaves the team and we cut to him years later in the mountains with a woman. Who the hell is she? I mean, her name is Kayla, but who the hell is she? We don't see how they met, how they know each other, what she's like. We just know they're suddenly together and they smile so lovingly at each other that she's clearly dead. Was it the wars? Which one? All of them. Viet Civil World War Nam. I can't see Hugh Jackman ever slumming a performance, but even he doesn't seem as into it as usual. Look at his face here as he's being given the origin story of his name. He doesn't look like he's letting it sink in enough that it'll one day become his identity. He looks more like he's going through his grocery list in his head. So he told Kekawatsu that the moon had asked for flowers, and every mm, night milk, he looks up in the sauce, sauce, string and cheese. Things. I wonder if Count Chocula is in season he yet. Touch her again. He's not even hiding his accent half the time. So you're gonna take me to this island? You uh, have those powers over me? I ain't living here till you tell me where Victor is. I'm just gonna ask nicely. I'm letting this go by. Come on, bub. He sounds like an angry and constipated Rocco. Where I can kill Creed, Stryker, and pretty much everyone you hate in this world. Let's put another shrimp on the barbie. But Jimmy's brother finds like you'd remember her name if I said it and pours fake blood all over her. I originally meant this as a joke, but as we find out later, that is what actually happens. If I can tell from a distance that's not real, how can this dumbass with heightened senses not pick that up? Even this supposed big emotional moment seems half-assed, as the music and his screaming seems randomly cut short. This whole film feels like it was written by a Google program. Protagonist befriends love interest for five minutes of screen time. Old friend betrays protagonist at exactly 30 minute mark. Protagonist screams for 5.1 seconds. This should equal you crying. Why aren't you crying? You're not from around here, are you? Actually, my name's Sabretooth. I chose it based on a story where a spirit came down to Earth, and you know what? I chose it because it's cool. Well, why can't that be a thing? The cat dragged in. Guys, whatever this is, take it outside. Now, Skeeter, they ain't hurting nobody. <laughs> Jimmy finds Sabretooth, and they have an amazingly bad action sequence that you can barely make out because it's shot and edited, I think, by an actual Wolverine. <laughs> no, yeah, they say a firing squad tickles, but a log, that's what takes the mighty Wolverine out of action. <laughs> Where is he? Where is he? He wakes up in a hospital where Stryker approaches him just in time to do his Pacino. Six years I've been here. No one knew me and then you show up and the next day she's dead. Where my children come to play with their toys. Stryker offers Jimmy a procedure to make him indestructible, despite him already being indestructible, by giving him an adamantium skeleton. Ah, I'm so glad we haven't seen this imagery yet. Hugh Jackman's acted this being experiment to shtick so much, he's literally playing it in his sleep. Or dead, I believe that too. Well, I guess he can't die. We just can't resuscitate this movie. He wakes up though, hearing that they want to erase his memory, and he goes after them. But first... A tasteful glimpse of me bottom for the ladies. Think if they just emphasize an X that makes a good X-Men movie? Go get a Peter Pan right here off of this dam, right here! Of course, it wouldn't be a comic book origin story without the friggin' nicest silver-haired angels that offer parental advice to our main character. Though their kindness might be characterized as borderline insanity if you would give shelter to a naked man breathing heavily in your barn. It's cold. Yeah, it's usually bigger than that. Oh, just had a rough night. Yeah, you can say that. Well, I see no threat emulating from this. Feel free to stay in our home and play with my grandchildren. So Jimmy, despite using them earlier, apparently forgot he had claws as he looked incredibly surprised when they pop out of his knuckles. 
after he picked them up from Toontown. What is up with those effects? It looks like someone ripped off the fangs from the Tiger and Ice Age and glued them onto his hand. The first film had half the budget of this one and they made them look okay. This flick, I keep expecting cartoon faces to pop on them like, Hi, Jimmy, where are your claws? <laughs> I swear I'm gonna pay for it. Well, logically, I should throw your crazy ass out, but we're Canadian, we have a stereotype to keep up. <laughs> Mostly. The old man gives Jimmy his son's jacket, who, thank God, also happened to be a muscle-bound beefcake, as the missus brings in some refreshments for them. I brought you some. Oh dear, I'll have to make more. Weapon X is in the barn. Well, glad to know we elevated from Blue Sky Animation to DreamWorks Animation in the same film. Blow him to bits. Let's see if he can survive that. Uh, sir, he survived exactly that! You know, I'm not gonna lie, I was actually enjoying that few minutes with the old couple. That's probably why they got rid of it so fast. We get a chase scene that on paper sounds pretty cool, with a chopper, motorcycle, and jeep flying around and blowing shit up. But once again, it's shot and edited like a monkey, shaking you by the shoulders, going, ah, ah, ah. It's legitimately sad when the trailer holds longer on a shot than the actual movie does. It's funny how good innocent people tend to die around you. By the way, if you're wondering if lighting the gas leading to a giant explosion and walking away without looking in 2009 was cliched, no. It was embarrassingly cliched. So after summing up how people are liking this movie... Colonel, this is turning into a disaster. Wolverine rides to Vegas, where I'm not gonna lie, at this point I'd rather just see him gamble than carry out whatever mission he was on. Three Claw Stud? I totally watched that. But maybe Dukes knows. Fred Dukes? Develop a bit of eating disorder. We all got our coping mechanisms. Oh, yeah. So, you remember in X-Men a character called the Blob? One of the more famous foes whose mutant power was an indestructibly obese body? Well, now he's just a dude who put on a lot of weight. Still a mutant, but his powers have absolutely nothing to do with his size. He just let himself go. It's like saying Superman is still an alien, but he doesn't have superhuman strength. He just mimicked pumping iron a lot. Come on, man, look at him. Blob. Blob had bitch tits. Get in my belly! You know, with how PC things are becoming, you think an actor who isn't overweight playing an overweight character would be called Fatface? Jimmy beats him up to get information on where Sabretooth and Stryker are, and it looks like the two of them are out hunting another mutant. A young Peter Badanovich! Oh, please don't! Just remember please when we meet up don't. years later and I grow my hair blonde and I never talk. We are never to reference this. Blob says Jimmy can find another mutant who escapes Stryker's experiments named Gambit. I don't really know why he looks like Sawyer from Lost, but he gives us the only cool shot in the movie, so I have no choice but to like him. Two years I rode in that hell and I never... <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of funny too. Tell me something, Jimmy. But still not as funny as what he calls a bat. You even know how to kill me. I'm gonna cut your goddamn head off. He was literally just knocked out. How'd he get up there so fast? And I don't know aeronautics, but I'm pretty sure you can't helicopter down via cane the same way Dixie Kong does with her hair. You're Gambit! You and Dixie Kong should not be mentioned in the same sentence! Sabretooth escapes as Jimmy and Gambit stay for... Honestly, no reason to fight. This is a cartoon. All that's missing is a Tom and Jerry scream when he falls. Gambit finally agrees to help Jimmy get Stryker as Stryker puts the finishing touches on his latest mutant experiment. A few more hours. And he will respond to my commands. Absolutely. We're gonna make Momo a reality urban legend, my ass! Jimmy finally catches up with Stryker, and you gotta love how our lead is so unimpressive he's not even worth a head turn. I've learned that nothing motivates the men in your family like revenge. But gasp! What's-her-face is still alive! Wow, that's so underwhelming and not worth shitting a care that even Jimmy doesn't know how to react to it. He just kind of awkwardly kneels and lets out a reverse quack. <sighs> Wolverine. It's revealed that she worked with Stryker because he's holding her sister hostage, and her mutant power is she can touch people and influence them to think whatever she'd like. 
Now, on top of asking why the hell she doesn't just use that power to have Stryker hand her sister over, I mean, cry! See, from a storytelling standpoint, how cool it would have been if we saw them meet. She holds his hand, and from that point on, we have to re-watch the scene and ask, was this real love or just her mutant power? There could have been a brilliant dramatic setup here. But because that would mean making a connection with the characters instead of just doing things. Gotta do this thing, gotta do this thing, gotta do this thing. We're developed now. Jimmy tells her exactly what he told Fox after seeing this movie. I'm just a fool who got played. So obviously it's time to fight those who wronged him or he walks away. Wolverine. You know, this is all so amazingly underwhelming, you gotta wonder what Stryker was talking about at the end of X2. Remember when he was bringing up his past? You're an animal then, you're an animal now. If you really knew about your past, what kind of person you were, the work we did together. We stole a rock, gave you some tiny toon claws, and this lady you barely know didn't die. We were animals, animals! And I guess Sabretooth reveals why he suddenly betrayed his brother. Give me the adamantium. Test King. We had a deal! You would never survive the operation. So, over a hundred years of knowing this guy and you totally betray him because you just wanted adamantium in your bones? Something the guy says wouldn't work anyway? I think Tenderheart and Grumpy Bear have a more complex rivalry than that! Wolverine returns and helps free all the mutant cameos and, yeah, let's get this over with. The mutant that was being worked on earlier was Deadpool. Wait, is that you? By God, it's like the comic leaped onto the screen. Yeah, Striker finally figured out how to shut you up. But brilliant trolling can't keep one silent for long. Hey, I'm just keeping a cannon. Sadly, that's not what happens in this film, though. The, oh my god, can you imagine every copy of this movie they made afterwards? They put that part in, and that's where it ends. They roll the creds and everything. Oh my god, Ryan Reynolds, get on that! As Deadpool uses all the mutant powers surgically given to him. The dumb. It hurts. As Sabretooth, right the hell out of nowhere, decides he likes Jimmy again, and they decide to fight him. All this high-tech ingenuity and you have to type in your commands like a 1980s RPG? Got some great Spaceballs logic working here. It's a competition of which sucky effect can destroy the other. Toy Story claws are invaders in laser beams. Only the crappiest shall survive! They end up defeating him, but as Jimmy says, this isn't over. This doesn't change anything between us, Victor. We're brothers. And brothers look out for each other. Unless your memory is erased and I go working for a magnet man, you know how it goes. Who gives a dick is dying though, and Jimmy goes to say goodbye. I love you. I'm so cold. Really? You don't look it. You don't even seem annoyed to be dying. You can say things all you want, movie, but unless you commit to it. Stryker shoots two animanium bullets into his head, and yep, that's twice they try to fake you out that he might die. Ooh, and here's another nail biter. Spider-Man might not be back in Endgame, see far from home. I should make you pull the trigger, but that would make us no better than you. Walk into your feet, bleed. Well, that'll result in tons of people dying, but why start making sense now? Well, hi there, Mr. Clean. Mighty glad to know you. You're safe now. Who are you? Huh. Must have missed those on the x-ray. Also weird that Jimmy never told Xavier exactly what he did remember. Yeah, I woke up around a destroyed power plant on this exact date. Oh yes, I was totally there. With that starting point, I'm sure we can piece together where you came from. Oh, guess it doesn't matter. Good luck. It is a shame that Gambit guy didn't get much screen time, but I'm sure he'll get another starring role in a big moneymaker. And that was X-Men Origins Jimmy. I mean Wolverine. I mean... Jimmy.
Yeah, because this definitely was not Wolverine. Wolverine is one of the coolest characters in comic book history, but none of that would be reflected if you went off of this movie alone. It doesn't add up to the continuity of the films, it doesn't please any comic fans. It's way too boring and cliched to entertain newcomers, it's just a disaster. X-Men has had a shaky history in both comics and film, but when it comes to the absolute worst X-Men flick there is, you need look no further than X-Men Origins, Jimmy. And that was X-Month. I hope everybody had a good time. And I'm ready! Hyper, what are you doing here? Oh, well, I was in the animated intro, so I just assumed I'd be flying around as Rogue. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, that, that, that was more of a style thing. Wait, so, I'm... I'm not going to be an X-Men? Well, aren't we all X-Men in our hearts? No. We are now. Congratulations! I'll make it up to you later. Just get out of here! <gasps> so I hope you enjoyed X-Month and- I'm ready. Oh, for God's sake. I take offense at that. I'm not having us as the X-Men! Then why'd you have us in the intro? I just told the animator to draw something cool! Yeah, that was cool. Now let's actually do it. I can't! X-Month is over, so get out of here! Fine. Great. I'm ready. How did you even- I'm ready for my cameo as Dadly. I'm not doing that! And besides, you didn't cameo anywhere else! Sure I did! Here, look! You see? You always need a cameo from the creator. You didn't create the Nostalgia Critic. Sure I did. Look, when a man and a woman love each other very much, beat it! <sighs> hey, Critic, we're here for X Month. Oh my god, it's already over! And you didn't invite us? Well, it was your idea! Exactly. exactly! Oh my god, can you just go away before other people spontaneously appear in my corner? Ah! You false advertised critic! Yeah, none of us were in X Month. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll make it up to you all somehow. Oh, you mean by reviewing a movie starring a person you never wanted to talk about again? Stop right there! I know how this works. You bring up a movie or a person I don't want to talk about, and once I talk about them, their picture pops up and I'm stuck reviewing it. Well, I'm not falling for it this time, so get out! Well, I think she was just talking about. Out! Out! Everybody out! Fireball! Out! Oh, it's like oh, Christmas God. with the Hitlers! Lousiest cameo I've ever had. There, now I'm not bound to anything. I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. Damn it! Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember so you don't have to. I guess Jubilee just did a new ad for Xavier School of the Gifted and she wanted my opinion on it. You know it's a little odd to be reviewing an advertisement, right? Oh, I'm sorry. What commercial special are you up to this year? Twelve if you count the Christmas one, but what does that matter? <sighs> just look this over and tell me what you think. At Xavier School for the Gifted, we provide a home for mutants of every kind. For years I've said that I shouldn't have to parade around in this human form, that I should be able to show the world what I actually look like. Wait, hasn't she tried to kill you guys a lot? She agreed to do this when I said she could show her true form. Oh. Now, for the first time, I'm gonna show the world my true form. Good news, I'm totally fine staying in my human form all the time. Wait, what was that? Ugh, the stupid timeline must have been altered again. Seeing as how I was raised with Xavier as his loving sister. Loving sister? They sure didn't act that way half the time. I'm happy to be at Xavier's school until my contract's up. I mean, until it's time to move on. There's even more satisfied mutants. <laughs> I know it seems almost silly being here as my mutant power is to adapt to anything, which basically makes me immortal. Oh, guess it does. But Xavier's school has still helped me immensely, even though I can never die. I died stupid fast, going out like a little bitch. What? But how the hell is he still alive? Ugh, the timeline's turned us into a horror series now. I must defeat a giant CG bear in a mental institution because that's what being an X-Men is all about now. <laughs> What do you think so far? I think the Star Wars movies have more consistency. Okay, let me re-edit some of this to match the timelines. Give me a minute. It's hard to have a fluent franchise when things keep changing up. 
When Brian Singer's X-Men premiered in 2000, it was absolutely perfect. For the time. People weren't as open to comic book flicks, so some of the more fantastical elements had to be scaled down to lure more moviegoers in. Over the years, though, comic book movies have exploded and are surprisingly still going strong, with people accepting, even demanding, that film adaptations look as huge and epic as what was on the page, even if it might be a little silly. This almost seemed to happen with what many consider the best X-Men movie, First Class, bringing in the energy, color, and wild imagination the comics were known for. But while the film did well, it didn't do smash hit well. Part of that may be, it didn't have many of the big X-Men names fans wanted to see. <laughs> Wolverine! So Singer was brought back to direct Days of Future Past, combining the old cast with the new cast. The ones that survived. Yeah, you thought Last Stand was a bloodbath? Only five of the first class cast members survived for future movies. No, I still blame Ratner. The film was creative and entertaining enough, despite they probably should have done one more film with the new cast for this to flow better. But I get it, you gotta keep mainstream audiences interested, and you don't know how long your most popular actor is gonna be playing the same character. I understand where they're coming from. Where I don't understand where they're coming from is with 2016's X-Men Apocalypse. First off, we already saw who's gonna live in the last movie, so this apocalypse has some pretty low stakes. Second, while comic book movies continue to move forward, hell, even the X-Men movies continue to move forward, this one decided to take us back to that safe, serious, more grounded X-Men universe that Singer had started, despite some comic booky elements that clearly wouldn't fit. What would you prefer? Yellow spandex? Of course not. We're about blue spandex around here. Where you give the other Singer films leeway because of when they came out and what they did for comic book movies, this one feels weirdly behind the times. With boring fight scenes, boring melodramatic characters, and a boring story. Even the next film seems to mock how boringly predictable they've become. You're always sorry, Charles, and there's always a speech, and nobody cares. Yeah, you were off by one film, but I still agree with you. In fact, box office-wise, these titles should have been switched. So how do we go from wild new energy back to the same old, same old? Okay, I think I figured this out. Here's a re-edit. Being from the future, I'm excited that Xavier has utilized my talents to go on many exciting adventures. Nope, I'm just a cameo now. Looks like we'll have to give all that cool stuff to Kitty Pride. Nope, I'm a cameo too. Cool! Ugh. This is X-Men Apocalypse. We open on ancient Egypt, and I'm just gonna call it, unless you're this movie, CG pyramids are the kiss of death for your film being taken seriously. We see the ruler named Apocalypse, played by Oscar Isaac, is using other mutants to transfer his consciousness and powers into to grow stronger and live forever. Hey, remember when mutants were only discovered in the 60s? Glad to see there were no records of any of this eons ago. Yeah, but to be fair, those Egyptians were famously bad at documenting stuff. But he's betrayed and the tomb is sealed, resulting in his followers being origamied and Mars attacks to death. He's preserved through anime lines and we transition via a pretty creative passage of time told through James Bond's enemy's gun barrel. It's odd, but I kind of like it. However, the imagination stops there as we cut to the 80s, keeping to the film style of each installment taking place in a different decade, despite none of them aging, and we're given the ultimate line of quality. The greatest, most natural way to get across exposition. You know what it is! As everyone knows... Oh my god! How many times does this have to be addressed? There is no line lazier to get across information than, as you know. Because as I and everyone has said a million times, if we all know, why is it being said? As everyone knows. As you know. As you all know. As you may know. As you may know. As you know. As you know, I conducted a raid on the Great Library. And you know what's ironic? This is being said in a school. They probably don't know! That's why they're there, to learn stuff! You didn't even need the worst line ever written, you idiots! Can I please go to the bathroom? I think there's something seriously wrong with my eyes. Something is also seriously off with my dubbing. You wanna eyeball my girl? I'm just gonna keep knocking! Still knocking! Is this what bullies do? It's my first time, does it show? <laughs> this is of course Scott Summers with his powers going nuts in school. Hey, if you're gonna steal from X-Men films, steal from the best. But in East Berlin, we see Mystique, played again by Jennifer Lawrence, looking to rescue mutants who are being forced to battle. <laughs> Oh, 
who remember isn't fat from his mutant powers. He just put on a lot of weight. Oh, who cares? We actually saw the fight in that one. I'm not gonna lie, I thought a battle between Nightcrawler and Angel would be a lot cooler than this. But maybe that's because I don't care a thing about them. Nightcrawler is one of the most easily likable characters in X-Men history, yet all he is here is a worried face. Nothing else. And Angel, I'm not even joking, has more development in Last Stand than he does here. I at least remember him cutting off his wings, fighting with his father, saving him at the end. This dude fights, and... That's, that's about it. That's save him, Mystique. They have so much to offer that we can forget. Ah, mine's to dust. Next time, I'll actually hit you. She helps him escape, but meanwhile in Poland, we see Magneto, played again by Michael Fassbender, has made a new life for himself. With a wife and daughter, he's passionately writing obituaries for in his head. Good day. I don't know. She was kind and generous, always patient with her husband. Killed by a uh, falling building, evil mutant. No, humanity. It's always humanity. What am I thinking? Yeah, Fassbender is still great in this role, but his new life is so clearly manufactured just to be taken away, you might as well show his cute daughter feeding deer- OH COME ON! This can't be the 80s as SOMEBODY would have seen Commando and when rip off them ripping off Snow White! JESUS MOVIE! Where did you learn that song, Papa? I learned it from my parents. And one day, you'll sing it to your children too. Oh, come on, Dad, I'm eight, and even I know what's gonna happen to me. And here. With you? It's my clench locket. I will hold it tight in my hand when you... don't... die. Daddy. I'm just hoping someone somewhere hasn't seen a movie yet! Meanwhile, Scott, aka Cyclops, is taken by his brother Alex, aka Havoc, to Xavier's school where he bumps into Jean Grey, played this time by Sophie Turner. I just heard you in my head. I'm telepathic. I read minds. Well, stay out of mine. I don't need some weird girl creeping around in there. He's the most hated X-Men. Why? They're also greeted by Hank, played again by Nicholas Holt. Whoa, what happened to the big blue furry you? I keep him under control now. That's code for I didn't want to put on that damn makeup. Oh, the Jennifer Lawrence motto. Exactly. Cyclops is introduced to Xavier, played again by James McAvoy, who wants to test out his powers in the most safe, controlled, highly populated area on campus. My grandfather planted that tree. I think that was probably my favorite tree. Does that mean I'm expelled? Oh, on the contrary. I'm going to murder you. You're enrolled. You'll find I'm rather insane in these movies. There's a jet under the basketball court and I slay all of you in the future. We're all about consistency here. And because these movies still have no idea what to do with Jean, she just acts tormented again because everyone thinks that's all we want to see out of her. I just saw a sneak peek of Dark Phoenix. We also screwed. Oh, this is perfect! I just edited the scene where Jean talks about her experience at Xavier's school. As one of Xavier's closest students, I try to be the heart of the team by listening to everyone's problems and helping them through their emotional journeys. So I basically offer no advice, but everyone tells me I'm important. Damn it! Stupid timeline! Though I have a generically kind personality, it'll serve as contrast when I become angry and psychologically tortured. I've always been angry and psychologically tortured. Okay, hold up. This does bring up how the films never got Jean right. It's not that Jean is a phenomenal character or anything, but you can clearly see what her role is. She's the counselor Troy of the group, someone who can read minds and uses it sometimes to attack, but more often to heal. It's not as cool as, say, Gambit or Rogue, but it's still an important component, and both the comic and TV show utilized it. What happened isn't his fault. It's not your fault either. Do you think I did the right thing? You did what you had to do. So did they. You're supposed to be resting. Even you can't heal this fast. You're doing the best you can, but you're no good to the professor when you're like this. Relax a little. She helps people out by listening to them and being the words of kind wisdom. That's why the Phoenix Saga left such an impact. Because she was so understanding and patient, and becoming a power-hungry mass murderer was very jarring to see. But in the films, even when she's played well, she's still either just the prize or crazy. 
Just because other characters are drawn to her for no reason doesn't mean we'll be drawn to her for no reason. Well, what would you prefer? Yellow spandex? That's good news. We now wear yellow spandex. <sighs> hey, that stuff comes in handy. You never know what apocalyptic dishes may need to be washed. Back in Poland, Eric's co-workers figure out that he's the famous mutant terrorist. Actually, it's Magneto. Damn it! His daughter tries using her powers to scare them off, resulting in the most one in a million shot of an arrow piercing his daughter, going through her back, and stabbing his wife as well. I'm sure there's a fly that got impaled at the end of that too. <laughs> my god, he's really trying. He does know this is the ninth of these films, right? And this is my first appearance and even I'm phoning it in. He turns his clench locket into a revenge locket while in Egypt. Apocalypse is resurrected by some sort of cult, and he saves a young thief who will end up becoming Storm. I do enjoy building you up. Get it? Because you're building? Eh, it doesn't matter, you're dead. Wanna know how dumb this film thinks you are? Xavier visits Moira McTaggart, who explains to him how if Apocalypse is real, he'll gather four horsemen to complete his mission. Some kind of... apocalypse. The end of the world. Yes, they actually think you don't know what apocalypse means. Some kind of... apocalypse. So what? We're some kind of... X-Men squad? The end of the world. Yes, I work for the CIA, Charles. I know what apocalypse means. Well, as everybody knows, oh, I- Oh, piss off! Speaking of which, Apocalypse goes with Storm to her hideout and catches up on history by touching the TV. What are you doing? Input, 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 woo, woo! False gods. So much like the comic, Apocalypse powers are a little vague. I guess he can search the worldwide TV, upgrade mutants, and wall people. But we're never given the limit of what he can or can't do, which doesn't make him the most intimidating threat. His design I also don't think is as bad as everybody was making it out to be. I mean, it's not great, but the original's not the easiest design to work with. My biggest problem is just his height. If you told me this guy was gonna destroy the world, I'd believe it. If you told me this guy was gonna destroy the world, I'd say with what, a Papa Smurf rendition of King Tut? I'm not gonna lose sleep over this dude. Eh, it's been over an hour and a half. I guess we can cut back to our third build star. Always good to see your face, even if it's not yours. I was just about to do the time warp again. Mystique decides to take Nightcrawler to Xavier's, where he's introduced to Cyclops, Jean, and... Jubilee? Woo! Finally a time period where my clothes make sense. Kinda. Yeah, it's just that... What? Jubilee's now the same age as Cyclops, Jean, and Storm? Which technically means she's older than Gambit, Rogue, and Kitty Pride? That feels... wrong somehow. Oh, come on! On. I'm still the same age in the other X-Men movies. Hey, wait, that's a good point. One of the things altered by the timeline is when Jubilee was born? In fact, Angel's born at a different time, too? This doesn't make any sense. Look, I'm about to take them to the mall and actually give this movie some personality. <sighs> You're right, everyone's been so mopey and down in these movies. Let's finally connect with these characters and show they have some humanity. I'd like to go to the mall. All right. Where does he keep his cars? Oh, let me guess. We don't see them go to the mall, do we? The one time we can actually give likability to anyone and is thrown away for costume upgrades. Well, there is a scene of us exiting a movie. Empire is still the best. Well, at least we can all agree the third one's always the worst. Oh, ho, 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 I see what you did there. You mean the one that practically ignored Angel? Turned Psylocke into a villain, killed off half the cast, botched the Phoenix Saga, made Storm pissed off, had Mystique switch sides, forced Jean to do angsty faces, was incredibly disjointed, and changed a ton of shit from the comics? Yes! Imagine nobody learning from that! Well, at least I'm not a vampire. You got nothing. I got nothing. Apocalypse upgrades more mutants who have been unfairly pissed on in other adaptations. You got children of the Adam Silo, count your victories. Magneto goes to get revenge on the men who outed him before he's so rudely interrupted. Who the fuck are you? 
Yeah, still riding that one F-bomb you're allowed. You're not gonna recapture the magic of this. Go fuck yourself. I'm not here for them. I'm here for you. Sorry, my heart belongs to Xavier. I do like that Apocalypse takes his revenge away, encouraging Magneto to take his anger out on humanity. But tell me if this scene works, where he takes him back to where he watched his parents die. This is where your power was born, and this is where your people were slaughtered. You shouldn't have brought me here. Are you afraid to be here? Can you really take this that seriously with Spirit Halloween hanging out in the background? The first film kept the imagery pretty grounded here. Yes, there were superpowers being used, but we didn't see Mortal Kombat Swimsuit Edition distracting us. I'm just waiting for her to say, Too bad you will die. Apocalypse teaches him to be an earthbender as Mystique is reunited with Xavier. Have a seat. It's good to see you, Raven. Welcome home. This isn't my home. You know, that's another really big problem. All the relationships built in the past two films are kept separated for most of this film. And even when they do meet up, they're not happy to see each other. Raven, you're back. When Wolverine sees Rogue again, it's nice. You feel like they have a connection. When someone meets up here, they might give you a look if you're lucky, but they mainly just talk. Charles wants students, not soldiers. He thinks the best of people. He has hope. Everyone just looks miserable in this movie. X-Men can be dark, but it's supposed to be fun, too. And nobody's having fun in this. Well... Okay, we'll get to that in a minute, but first Apocalypse uses his powers to launch all the world's missiles into space. You know, for a guy who wants to destroy the world, he had a pretty good chance right there. But Apocalypse senses Xavier's powers and breaks it. Oh no, the school's in danger, that's new. <laughs> Epic uses his Care Bear stare, but accidentally hits the jet, blowing everything up. <gasps> Look out! Fun! So this is the only scene where the film's pretty enjoyable. Quicksilver, played again by Evan Peters, moves so fast he saves everyone before the explosion kills them. All to the song Sweet Dreams. Yes, I'm aware I'm bitching about Singer doing the same thing he does in his other movies, and this is beat by beat a ripoff of the last flick, but this film is so uninteresting, even a ripoff of something fun, I'll accept as something fun. <laughs> It's clever, it's energized, and for a series that embraced whatever decade it was in, this is the only section that really has an 80s feel to it. If they had these effects at the time, you would totally see this in an 80s comedy. But, all good things. Oh, I forgot I turned blue whenever Annie Lennox plays. They look up to you. That's not what they need. Thank God I saved some makeup artists their paychecks. But Cyclops realizes Havoc was lost in the blast. while you're no doubt bawling at the loss of his brother who had so little interaction you'd never figure out they were brothers unless you were told. This does bring up a good question. Who's the main character in this? I mean, I know one of the criticisms of these flicks is that Wolverine gets too much focus, and I do understand that, but at least there is a focus. Even first class, with how well that balanced all its characters, it still focuses on Xavier, Magneto, and Mystique as the primaries. There's about an hour of the movie left, and I still have no idea who the leads are. It's not like Infinity War Endgame where most of these people had their own movie prior. I've never seen this Cyclops before. I've never seen this Jean before, or Nightcrawler. They're clearly different from the other films, so some time should be dedicated for getting to know them, and I feel like I don't know shit about them. But come on, that all had to be pushed aside for this entirely pointless out-of-nowhere subplot where Stryker comes in and kidnaps everybody to take him to a military base. Get in the pilot sets, don't let them take off. I can't, I can't reach the pilots, I can't reach anyone. Well, why is that? Okay, gotta get through the cash bomb we dropped for Hugh Jackman. You know him, Magneto. Speaking of out-of-nowhere, Quicksilver reveals he's actually Magneto's son. Oh, now you want to follow the comic? What a completely random time to do it. Why do you care so much? Is he a speech on TV or something? He's my father. I met him ten years back, but I didn't know it was him. Yeah, I stay away from this man. Singer and subplots about fathers don't mix. You will send a message to every living mind. Meanwhile, on a pure flick set, Apocalypse tells Xavier to send a telepathic message to the world about its impending destruction. You know, give him a heads up. I might play a role in this madness. You have the most important role of all. I'm the hostage, aren't I? How did you know? I'm always the hostage! Meanwhile, look! Wolverine's wearing the thing! 
I know this scene affects nothing and we wasted dozens of minutes to do it, but Wolverine's wearing the thing! Wolverine's wearing the thing! You got X-Men! Scott Lee. Oh, and speaking of odd moments I don't want to think about. I know technically Wolverine's been alive decades longer than most, but him meeting Jean as a kid knowing he's gonna want to bonk her in the future is a little... Breaking Dawn-ish. Or, wait, does that not occur too? What happened to these movies, man? I found a piece of his past and gave it back to him. Just a few memories I could reach. Well, can someone return you giving a shit? Because that was clearly missing from that line. Hope that's the last we've seen of that guy. The students are freed, and we abandon this completely unneeded detour to see Apocalypse and his horsemen are beginning to destroy the world. Alright, so this is usually where the big epic set piece goes, say, fighting on top of the Statue of Liberty, lifting the Golden Gate Bridge, moving a stadium. But here's something I bet you haven't seen in a movie yet! CG buildings getting destroyed! It barely even registers we've seen this shit so many times. I mean, who's gonna leave this film saying, yeah, it was pretty dull, but they do that thing we've been watching 20 straight years of? Whoa, I haven't seen the guy who directed Boring Superman try that. I'm in! Seven's Wonder, 12 o'clock. The X-Men fly in to try and stop him while Apocalypse tries to transfer his body into Xavier's. Huh. Don't remember Psylocke using her power as a lasso, but this is coming up, so snip snip. Mistake. I know you think you've lost everything, but you haven't. You have more family than you know. Yes, talk softly to get his attention. I'm sure he'll hear you over the literal end of the world. I should point out, by the way, that Lawrence got a lot of flack in this movie for apparently not trying, and I... Kind of disagree. Everyone in the movie has a downer way of saying their lines that gets very old very fast, but this is one of the few characters where I feel like it works. She is on the verge of giving up. She does feel like she's betrayed herself and her cause, so I totally buy the defeated performance that she usually gives. You know, I really believed that once. I really believed we could change them after DC. Just because there's not a war doesn't mean there's peace. That is... Except when she's in the blue makeup. Forget everything you think you know. I'm gonna go fight for what I have left. None of that matters. She is bizarrely awful when that stuff is on her. And all I can figure is she wants out of it so bad, it's all she can focus on. That's what I've come here to tell you. There is a bubble bath of makeup remover waiting for you. Say the stupid lines and you can swim in it. I'm here for my family too. Quicksilver doesn't tell Magneto that they're related, nor does he in the next movie, so you figure out the point of that. But it looks like the guy who can fly crashes in a falling airplane. Have fun figuring out that one too. Charles? I'm here to give you the only other cool scene in the movie. Can we just call this series X-Man and only make it about him? Apocalypse figures out how to stop him, but Xavier goes inside his head to... Give you a scene where he's finally big. Yay, trailers found a way to trick the fans again. Even Magneto decides to fight for good. You betrayed me. I betrayed them. Mystique's acting was so unmoving, it moved me. And remember all those people who said, if Singer did the Phoenix Saga, he would have done it right. Well, here you go. <laughs> Another internet what if totally sodomized by reality. Remember, aliens are gonna give me the Firebird in the next movie, so I have no idea what this is! Apocalypse is surprisingly easy to kill, and everyone unites except for Psylocke. Yeah, check out that look. She's totally coming back. She'll get her revenge in X-Men. Psylocke and Dazzler rock the world. I think our prayers were answered. So half the planet's a sandbox, but forgive and forget. I was right about Raven. I was even right about you. You may want to hide because you are wanted for literally everything. Oh, I'm totally giving that Storm Girl another shot, though. Just because she was a horseman of the apocalypse doesn't mean she should do jail time. Oh, did I say yet that Singer likes to repeat the same shit? Doesn't it ever wake you up in the middle of the night? The feeling that one day they'll come for you. I feel a great swell of pity for the poor soul. You never have a plan. Stop pretending you do. Let's wrap this up with Lawrence acting like she's eyeing that turpentine shower. You're not kids anymore. You're not students. You're X-Men. 
Turner sitting there thinking, eh, just once I like to wrap up a series on a high note. I can't watch where this franchise is going. So that was X-Men Apocalypse, and much like a real apocalypse, it was over before it even started. When I first saw it, I guess I viewed it as just another Singer X-Men movie, so I kinda lowered my standards. But that's precisely the problem. It just does what those other films over 15 years old have done, minus the charm. Without a main character, without any new ideas, without any real focus, you notice the problems even more. Yeah, those early flicks had issues, but they also had memorable characters, cool fights, and decent enough discussions about prejudice and where society could be going. This tries to do so much of the same, yet somehow misses all those key elements. It's like recreating a beautiful cake, but it's made out of salt and salmon. You're clearly missing the important ingredients! The things that should stay the same are changed, and the things that should change stay the same. There just isn't any good consistency. Thank God for films like Logan and First Class, because they remind me that this premise can work cinematically. But it has to be given to those who can add more to it rather than take away. Like an expired wine, it only gets fouler with age. Okay, I think I finally got this down. Oh look man, too many things have changed. I really think you should scrap it and start from scratch. But I got Wolverine in this one! Check it out! <sighs> Go ahead. I used to be a blood-hungry animal, but after Xavier's school, I've learned to be a role model of hope for teens all over the world. Fucking everyone's dead in the fucking desert with no fucking light at the end of the fucking tunnel! Come here, you fucking psychos trying to fucking kill me! Jesus, blood is literally flying from the screen! It's okay. It gets better. Howdy, y'all. I'm Rogue. Hey, 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 here we go! <laughs> when I'm not throwing cars or flipping giant robots, I'm flying around the world beating up anybody who gets in my way. All right, now that's what I'm talking about! Xavier's school turned me from an angsty teen depressed by everything into one of the coolest mutants who ever lived. I'm an angsty teen depressed by everything. God damn it! Please don't come near me. That might put a smile on my face, and that would make me sad. All right, what is going on here? I mean, there's altering timelines, and then there's just... Insanity! Yeah, this does seem comedically specific. Somebody is behind this, and I demand that they show themselves! Well, come on! Who are you?! Go to Hogwarts! It's a better school! Hold on! Sorry, I just love a double punchline. I remember it so you don't have to. Apologies, you caught me in the middle of helping some friends stop an alien takeover. Hey, you guys find that mothership yet? No. It found us. What was that? Oh my god, I can't believe what I'm seeing. Sounds like us last night. <laughs> it looks like a portal to another world. Also something hurt last night. <laughs> Shitballs. What? Who is it? I told you, Shitballs. Her name is Shitballs. Oh, I thought she was like your first love or something. She was like my first love or something. Oh, Shitballs! It's been a long time, Devil Boner. Not long enough, Shitballs! Okay, what are parents naming their kids? I know we have a checkered past, but what if I told you behind that portal lies a power greater than love? Greater than love? That's impossible! Greater than adrenaline? Greater than lust? In fact, it's every feeling you've ever felt, plus new ones you didn't even know existed. My god, that's mind-blowing. 
Schnookum Bottoms, you're not thinking of trusting her? She's a bad seed, but she's been looking for this all her life. What if she's lying? She's not lying. I can tell. Trust me, Shark Teeth. This is the greatest journey you'll ever take in your life. Now hold on, guys. I got another call coming in. Hello? Quickly! We need your help. Jubilee has been possessed. <laughs> oh no. Sucks. All right, shitballs. We'll go through your portal, but no funny moves. Wouldn't dream of it. All right, setting our coordinates to- She's really not doing well. We think it's some kind of demonic force. Okay, that's a shame, but I barely know her, and this is a more interesting adventure. Nope, the church says she's a classic character who's been around for years. So logically, a story about her would be incredibly interesting. Nobody's given a shit about her for years. Even at the height of her popularity, she was kind of a drag. Critic, maybe you should take this one. Yeah, I don't think they're gonna leave us alone. But uh, the portal sounds like such a juicy adventure. Ah, come on, you won't be missing that much, right, shitballs? There is no experience greater than what... Oh. It's okay. There, you see? Now go help Jimmy Olsen. Jubilee. I don't care. <laughs> Nothing this bad has happened to me since I lost my parents at childhood. Really? Tell me about it. I just did. Okay, you can't get me to care if you just say that. How'd you cope? What pulled you through? Did the color yellow save your life? I mean, give me something! My life is nothing but torture! Isn't that enough for you? Surprisingly, no. Oh, the pain! <laughs> the pain a character goes through doesn't mean much if you can't relate to them. Take one of X-Men's most essential characters. Oh, thank you! Jean Grey. Dick. You're a dick! True, she's nobody's favorite, but she does play an important part. The emotional center. She's the character that people can talk to, open up to. The Horatio, or Counselor Troy of the group. That's why one of the most famous stories from X-Men is the Phoenix Saga. Not only does it involve countless worlds being destroyed, but it comes from one of the most kind and patient characters being possessed by an alien force. An alien force that at first seems helpful, but quickly turns into a genocidal entity. It's a great story. So good that these movies succeeded four times in fucking it up. Dark Phoenix is the last of the official X-Men movies that begun in 2000. Though you wouldn't know it from all the changes made to the series. I think the makers thought because there were so many films before it, they didn't have to establish much with the characters, but seeing how the characters focused on here really weren't that established to begin with, it blew up in their faces. Despite all the hate the film got, I don't think it's the worst of them like many have declared. We still live in an X-Men Origins world, thank you. It was definitely low on the totem pole, though, and was both a critical and box office disappointment. So, how did a series that already had one good finale have such a lackluster second finale? And a half? Well, let's take a closer look, because there's clearly no stories in X-Men or real life that would be more interesting right now. Hey, Critic, it's Hyper. Look what we can do in this dimension. They texted me a smell! How did they text me a smell?! Oh, my possession might mean the end of the world! Yeah, every possession does. Ow! This is Dark Phoenix. Oh, that's why these X-Men movies stopped, because they couldn't do anything with the X logo anymore. I thought it was weird in New Mutants, they just had the X glow anyway. Who are we? Are we simply what others want us to be? Are we destined to a fate beyond our control? I just imagine the X-Men actors wake up every morning on set saying this. We open with two happy parents taking their happy kid on a happy ride. <laughs> wow, they're dead! As it looks like the kid is Jean Grey and her powers distract her mother's driving. My cabbages! You're... grounded. She's approached by Charles Xavier, played a game by James McAvoy, once more proving that Jean in the movies isn't based on who she is, but only what happens to her and how others see her. Yeah, look at this kid. She lost her parents, it looks like it's her fault. I should feel awful. But they gave her no personality to feel awful about. Special's just a nice word for it. Weird. It can be a word used to describe people who are significant, or amazing, or just, it's really cool.
She just exists, and we're supposed to feel bad for her because everybody else feels bad for her. Take this pen. Now, you could choose to draw a really good picture with that, or you could use it to poke someone's eyes out. Or you could use it to write a better script. Speaking of which, I should point out this is writer-producer Simon Kinberg's directorial debut. And to his credit, a lot of the actors said they loved him and didn't even want to do another X-Men movie until they heard he was directing. He also admitted that the movie not connecting with audiences was on him. Similar to how Schumacher admitted not connecting to audiences with Batman and Robin. I feel bad because you can feel the passion behind his directing. In fact, when it cuts to the 90s, the film actually feels the most like an X-Men comic than it has in a while. Xavier has an X-Phone linked directly to the president. Even Batman doesn't have one direct to the president. And he's told astronauts are spinning out of control and only the X-Men in their X-Pajamas can save them. It's a simple extraction. We go into space, we get the astronauts, we bring them home. Any questions? Yeah, what the hell is simple about that? Like a true comic book movie, space is just a road trip condensed to a few minutes. It's just space! Will the X-Jet even get that on? Well, technically the- It'll get us there. Let's go. Okay, this is clearly ridiculous, but it's kind of fun, too. I am 13 years old again watching yellow spandex X-Men going into space, teleporting into shuttles, and using laser telescope technology to straighten them out. I'm sorry, this movie starts off pretty cool. And then, Jennifer Lawrence talks. I forget sometimes you can read mine. Scott, I need you to blast that thruster. Slow down the spin. Strap in, we're headed home. Yeah, unlike Apocalypse, where the bad acting seemed to only be in the blue makeup, this performance you can tell she's like, isn't my death scene yet? Isn't my death scene yet? You put those kids in danger. What is that voice? Charles, you're in no condition. We gotta get out of here. I said strap in. Don't make me explain what mother was about. Jean can hold the shuttle together, but only when she's in the shuttle. So Quicksilver duct tapes a spacesuit together. You know what? I don't care. I'm having a blast. No, do you want Fantastic Four? Because this is how you get Fantastic Four. They get everyone out, but the space anomaly enters Jean, and its Firebird-like energy possesses her. Yes, I know you thought the Firebird was one of her powers in the last one, but if there's anything the series is good at, it's pretending the other movies didn't happen. Jesus, Ty Sheridan has to emote with his eyes covered, and he still gets across more emotion than Lawrence with her entire face shown. Word of advice, buddy. Skip movies where you have to wear a visor through most of your performance. They end up saving Jean and the X-Men return home to a hero's welcome. As of now, mutants are celebrated, but as they discuss, it can turn on a dime. You put those kids in danger. They're not kids anymore, Raven. Yes, it has been a whole three years. I mean decades since we saw them last. God, they age so much. And by the way, the women are always saving the men around here. You might want to think about changing the name to X-Women. Wow. Not since Kim Possible introduced hench women has such a blow for equal rights been achieved! You might want to think about changing the name to ex-women. How about ex-guys? Girls are included in the term guys! I, mean, I think that's the sin- okay. Luna! But an alien force is looking for their pet destroyer of worlds as one of them kills a woman at a party and takes on her form, played by Jessica Chastain. At first I thought maybe this was a soft reboot of Emma Frost, but upon doing more research I found this character is actually named Vuk. Now, I'm sure that name is supposed to be pronounced a different way, but seeing how there's tons of other villains that would have been cooler here, and it looks like almost nobody knows who this villain is, I'm just gonna keep calling her Vuk, because everyone no doubt will be saying who the Vuk is that? Still, I don't think this movie has reached bad territory yet. In fact, I squeal like an idiot every single time I see that motherfucking Dazzler is in this movie! <laughs> okay, she's just the musical performer, but I'm sorry. Whatever star rating I gave this before, I'm adding another star. Bringing it up to... Well, it's something. But Jean is acting... different? I don't know. We still have no idea what her personality is. Oh, I didn't finish this one. Two more? I'd say this isn't like you, but I don't know what like you is like. They notice things going wrong on their child-watching thermo cameras. Which at first I thought was quite disturbing, but realizing every kid is an atom bomb with teen hormones, it does kind of make sense. And Xavier uses Cerebro to look inside her mind. Again, to the film's cred, this is some of the cooler imagery I've seen done with Cerebro in the movies. 
I had to make adjustments to her mind when she was young. What kind of adjustments? I sent her down a little river called Denial. She uses her powers to open up repressed memories Charles silenced, causing him to pass out. Yeah, I haven't seen that in an X-Men yet. And she discovers her father is still alive. She figures out where he is and goes to visit him. Gene? There is no Gene, only Zool. Ah, good. Let me tell you about my crazy daughter, Gene, then. She's an insane psychotic. I'm not too far off, as Gene discovers she was the reason her mother died, and he wanted no part of her after that. I'm sorry, Gene. But my whole world died that day, and you went with it. You're like the little pee that comes out when you poop. It's all being flushed. The X-Men arrive and try to talk sense into her. It doesn't go well. That's our Superman looking at Flash scene. Now everybody wave goodbye to Quicksilver, because if he was in the rest of the movie, it'd be over pretty quickly. Mystique tries to talk sense into her as, according to the film, they're best friends. Something's happening to me. So come home. Let me take care of you. Yep, even though there was just one scene where they said they were besties and then they like never make eye contact afterwards. Can't you feel the chemistry? I'm not afraid of you, Jean. Look at me. Focus on my voice. Please, put my performance out of his misery. Okay, one movie too late, but I hope you enjoy my table scraps. Oh. Beast is absolutely heartbroken because, oh yeah, they're kind of a couple. No joke, I totally forgot that because it was referenced so little in this film and the last. And Charles, I dare say, looks more annoyed than distraught that the sister he grew up with is dead. It's almost like they said, we don't know what emotion we want for this scene, so to be safe, just do all of them in one face. <laughs> Perfect! See? She did stuff. She's a fascinating character. No, just because she did something major in the movie doesn't mean she's a fleshed out character. Yes, it does. I feel like I can so relate to her. Okay, name one thing she likes. Cyclops, duh. No, not a person, a thing. It can be a food, hobby, song, even a freaking pet. Just name one thing she has an interest in. Dying? Oh, it's making its way into my heart. I'm gonna be a black writer. Whoa. My God, Greg. It's like all of the questions of the universe are answered here. What, so shitballs didn't betray you? Oh, she did, instantly. But this place is so amazing. Her and Devil Boner are killing each other and also being reborn at the same exact time. Oh my god, you're tackling so many amazing concepts! Oh, I also discovered I'm a descendant of the Banana People, a race bent on destroying all fan fiction. What? That must be so conflicting for you! Oh, we also discovered Bill's backstory. Oh my god, I always wanted to know that! It's like we always knew it, yet we didn't. You really have to be here to understand. Well, see ya. Faking it. It's one of those great mysteries. After burying Mystique, the rest of the X-Men try to figure out what to do next. She killed Raven. That was not Jean. Not the Jean I know. She's not the Jean anybody knows because nobody knows Jean. And it's kind of a shame because some of these scenes are well acted. Like imagine you were an X-Men fan but never saw an X-Men movie. You'd probably be impressed if you saw this clip on its own and were told it was from a Dark Phoenix film. Charles, just admit you were wrong, please. I hope that railing on me five minutes after I put my foster sister in the grave has made you feel a This isn't about me. You know what? I know what I did wrong, okay, Charles? She was gonna leave. Truth be told, a lot of scenes work fine when separated from the rest of the movie. It's similar to Last Stand in that respect. But when you put them together and see how little is established at the core, that's where it falls apart. It's like the movie skipped the first act setting up the characters and jumped straight to the middle. Oh, and speaking of Last Stand, Jean Grey as the Phoenix talks about teaming up with Magneto. They're just coming up with all sorts of new ideas, aren't they? <laughs> Magneto.
Magneto, played again by Michael Fassbender, has been given refuge in a place where other hostile mutants try to be left alone. Jean doesn't exactly help things out. Heads up, we're not here for you this time. Jean goes crazy again and starts attacking the soldiers. Call it a draw! Magneto sees she's too dangerous and tells her to piss off. You need to leave. Go! I may be crazy, but you're crazy. Jean's hostile ways have people looking at mutants as a threat again. Even the president isn't calling as much as he used to. There's no need to throw away everything that we've accomplished. You have to give us a chance and... He called me fat and challenged me to a push-up competition. Meanwhile, Vok finds Jean in a bar and tells her she knows how to make things all better. I really like the way they show that Jean is clouding everybody's minds to make it look like she's someone else. You can't control my mind like theirs. Yeah, whatever. You get my poker game ready or what? She's taken to Vok's alien race called the Davari. That's technically in the comic, but as far as I know, it didn't play that big a role in the Phoenix Saga. At least, not as big as White Queen, Gladiator, Lalandro, or the Hellfire Club. This is strange, because the Hellfire Club was actually well set up in first class. And a lot of those characters played much more interesting parts in the story. These schmucks just want to harness Jean's powers for world domination. Your world will be ours. You kill us all. Yes. I don't know why, just evil. We saw it enter you in space. We were there, Jean, following that force. Strange Earth's radars never picked up any of that, but seeing how our technology is so primitive we can just go into space like a drone dropping off a package, I'm surprised we can do anything. Hey, another favorite pastime of these movies, ripping off Star Trek 2. You could control what's inside you to create whole new worlds. They say the energy source destroyed their home world and everything it comes in contact with except Gene. Why? You are the one, Hatterak, Dragon Warrior, Daughter of Eden boy who lived. There's no reason. Yeah, it's just the chosen one trope. Honestly, she's so poorly developed, I don't even know if her violent moments are her being crazy or the Phoenix possessing her. I don't even know if the Phoenix is supposed to have a personality in this. She's dead. Jean killed her. We see Beast teams up with Magneto and tells him about how Jean killed Mystique. With both of them swearing revenge, Charles discusses what's the best course of action. Kurt, I'd like to take Scott and I there, but that's all. I want you to leave us there, and then come home. And me. I'm not talking to you now as X-Men. I'm talking to you as X-Women. Mystique would have wanted it that way. They all agreed to protect her, not just from the aliens, but from Beast and Magneto's wrath. Pretty tough to mock a franchise's cliches when the franchise does it for you. I'm sorry for what she did. You're always sorry, Charles. And there's always a speech. But nobody cares anymore. Boy, it's not often a movie's review quote is from the movie itself. This leads to an action scene that's not bad, and does have a pretty cool effect with Magneto bringing a train out of the ground, but A, he's got a buzz he could have done the exact same thing with, and B, it's so friggin' dark! Did the dark and dark phoenix mean not lighting a scene properly? Huh, that's the first that train's ever been on time. Magneto tries to kill her, but she's too powerful, ironically using the helmet to protect his head to squash his head. Have you come to kill me too? Never. Jean, never. Then why was this called Operation Kill Jean? Walk to me. No. <gasps> Monsieur has been walked! The authorities arrive and actually de-escalate the situation for once in these movies and arrest everyone. My kid used to be a fan. Someone else read the IMDb comments, huh? Raven had the right of it. Jean was never the villain. Can I be transferred to a different car? He's gonna say sorry, followed by a speech. I just mocked this. I was wrong. There's the sorry. I would never do anything intentionally to hurt And her. here's the speech. Did the writer read his own script? <laughs> but the aliens attack, which really seems counterproductive. We all know the MCU is gonna have their way with them eventually. The X-Men break free and try to fight them off, again in this butt-ugly environment where you can barely see a thing. Do you know what happens to aliens when they're struck by a toad? No, wait, how'd that go? Oh, it sucks either way. No, 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 no,
Oh no, Nightcrawler's mad. I have to keep reminding myself he's even in this movie, but whoa, now I'm invested. Yeah, that's hardcore. Break their necks. Revenge for that soldier before she fell, or he fell. I'm sorry, who was that again? Do oh, I don't care. Cracking necks. This movie means something now. I'll give him this. It is one of the few times Cyclops' laser actually does come across as a little badass. Something about how fast they just fly all over the place. I don't know, it's actually kinda cool in this one. But Vuck shows up, and it's a showdown between her and G, because their rivalry has been so well built up. Your emotions make you weak. Was this written like 30 years ago? That's like today's you and I are so alike. <laughs> it's okay! I'm sorry, and I have a speech! Jean sacrifices herself with her alien magicness. I'm sorry, what was the phoenix in this again? And the team is so moved, they renamed the school after her. I guess like most places named after people, maybe one in a thousand will ask who that is and immediately forget. Sounds appropriate for her, actually. I know who I am now. Well, good, because we never did. I am not simply what others want me to be. Exact opposite of that, but continue. This is not the end of me, or the X-Men. Box Office strongly disagrees with you. It's a new beginning. I evolved. You know, it's amazing. You are 100% wrong. I mean, nothing you've said has been right. Hey, slow down. Hey, anyone remember Magneto's my father? I eh, guess not. Seems to look after the school while Charles travels abroad because he's had such an exhausting time ruining people's lives. Just one game. Rope time soon. Knock it off, Eric. You know neither of us know how to play. But we look so smart doing it. Fine, we'll fake it till we make it. That's the X-Men movie way! And that was Dark Phoenix, and... Oh my god, the chart says this is the happiest day of my- <gasps> A chart-related emergency! Well, that's far more important. Are there really no better adventures we could utilize? There's so many more interesting stories and concepts that could be focused on. Making another film that has Dark Phoenix is like doing the Green Goblin Gwen Stacy bridge scene again. It's just been botched too many times to leave an impact anymore. I don't think this is the worst X-Men movie, but its problems are very clear. The characters aren't developed, it's visually boring, the story is tired, and it relies on tropes that are way too outdated. You can make the thread as big as you want, but if there isn't an interesting character or idea at the center of it, your interest is not going to be kept. It's a shame the X-Men movies have to go out this way, because there's a treasure trove of great stories that, it sadly looks like, are never going to be utilized. No, nope, the chart says you're wrong. You are to help Jubilee until she recovers. Okay, look, I don't even think she's possessed. I think she's been faking it the whole time. Hello? Oh shit, maybe it was real. The time has come for me to take over and or destroy the world! <laughs> Jesus, who would have the know-how or the vengeance to possess you like this? I just put it together, Potter. Oh. Bottoms wallops. Come on, play nice and possess her. But I still want revenge from the Percy Jackson review! And I want revenge for the Fantastic Beast movies. We can't always get what we want. Now hop to it. Ah, fine. That was an accident, right? I'm pretty sure yes. Well, I guess there's only one thing to do. Like I gave a shit. Did you know the meaning of life is invisible colors? Lose my number.